in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. Checking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. We have an exciting show for you today. The newly launched Morning Brief is live in two locations here in New York City and in Davos, Switzerland for day three of the World Economic Forum. Our own Brian Sazi and Julie Hyman, who you see there on the screen, they've got snow boots on the ground in the Swiss Alps and join us now to reveal one big theme of the day from the gathering of world leaders. Saz, Julie. Uh, and that, those boots have been very, very busy, uh, Brad. Now, our theme of the day here at Yahoo Finance has been the risk or the downside risk of all things AI. We put that question to Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff. Take a listen. AI has to be almost a human right to have access to, hum to, to AI, and we need the governance mm -hmm. around AI. Listen, we're coming into a really critical year on elections, mm -hmm. and we all understand social media and what social media can be like and what can happen with social media and how it can go really wrong and hey, the reality is over the last decade social media has been kind of show yeah so obviously you get the idea how benioff feels about the need to perhaps put some guardrails around ai you're going to hear the full interview with the salesforce ceo later on on yahoo finance along with a lot of other interviews that saz and i are doing amongst them in just moments novartis ceo vasnar simon is going to be with us you'll also hear our conversation with john kerry who in just a few months is going to be stepping down as special climate envoy for president biden guys all right, Julian says we look forward to those conversations. And of course, we're going to bring you more from Davos in just a few minutes. But first, we have got two readings on the economy, both here and abroad. China's growth is slowing to a three decade low and retail sales here in the U.S. showing that the consumer is still spending. Let's get right to it. Three things you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Ines Ferre and Josh Lipton have more. Yeah, Shauna, the state of the consumer appears to be strong. December retail sales out this morning, showing that the U.S. consumer spending continued to prove resilient to round out 2023 and push back against fears that economic growth stalled in the year's final months. But are the signs of a consumer slowdown ahead? We'll break that down. And regional banks in focus this morning. Citizens Financial Charles Schwab and U.S. Bancorp reporting a lower Q4 profit than the street had anticipated. This comes after PNC kicked off earnings from smaller banks reporting a sharp decline in profit as well. We'll break down what we learned about the consumer so far this earnings season. And the JetBlue Spirit Airlines merger takes a hit. A federal judge in Boston siding with the Biden administration to block JetBlue's $3.8 billion acquisition for Spirit Airlines. We'll break down how its peers could benefit from the court ruling. Inside of 30 minutes until the start of trade, let's get you up to speed on how markets are moving this morning as we're taking a look at the futures here on the screen. The Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ futures all pointing lower. They've been pointing that way pretty much since we saw that reading come out of China in their own GDP. And then additionally here, retail sales this morning. We're going to continue to dive into all of that economic data. We've also got to take a look at the Treasury market here this morning, see where yields are moving. I believe we have a quick look at that for our viewers at home as well as we're pulling up the 5, the 10, and the 30-year yields you're seeing green across the screen right now. Yeah, the 10-year yield pushing further above that 4% level. Well, let's start it off with today's top story, a slew of fresh economic data ahead of the market. Open two big stories that are moving stocks. First, underwhelming GDP results out of China. Then we're also getting retail sales here in the U.S. Let's zero in on retail, the state of the U.S. consumer, Josh Schaefer, here with us at the desk. And Josh, once again, I'm taking a look at these numbers. The consumer keeps spending, even in the face of this risk that we keep hearing about, about downside and possibility of a recession. Yeah, a lot of talk about the slowdown, and the slowdown doesn't come, right? I mean, this report, for it feels like eight months now, relatively, has been kind of the same story. A lot of people expecting some level of a slowdown, and we just don't quite see it. So the retail sales in December grew 0.6%. Economists had expected 0.4%, and that's up from 0.3% in November. So again, just a little bit above expectations here. One thing I did want to highlight that I found personally interesting when we think about 2023 as a whole, you can look at the annual numbers in this report, 
And so for the year, our uh, 2023 recession year, right, Brad? This is when we were going to have that big recession. We had retail sales, excluding auto and gas, up 4.9%. Sales at food services and drinking places for all of 2023, up 11.3% for the year. That was the leading category. And gasoline, down 11.5%. So we know spending at gas stations obviously comes down as prices come down. Guys, I think the big question here, of course, is going to be, does this slow down in January or February? But considering I've sort of made fun of the fact that we've been talking about that for 10 months, it feels hard to, to see that coming in some ways. Yeah, the recession that has yet to arrive, at least in full beyond what some people would look at as a technical level. And we'll see ultimately when the NBER mm. ultimately does declare that there was a recession entered into, which is usually well after the fact anyway here. Yeah. Josh, we're going to continue to see how the markets are moving on this data here this morning. Thanks so much, Josh Schaefer. Now the morning brief is heading across the Atlantic to Davos, Switzerland for day three of the World Economic Forum. Brian Sazi and Julie Hyman on the ground with some big <laughs> interviews ahead. Brian and Julie, how's it looking over there? Well, in our case, I guess it's the afternoon brief, right? <laughs> because we're six hours ahead of you. But yeah, we've got our ear to the ground here in Davos, and there's still been a lot of discussions about AI. There's a lot of discussions about geopolitics, and that includes, by the way, the U.S. elections and sort of how all of this is playing out around the globe, and people are really trying to wrestle with a lot of weighty issues here. By the end of our chat here, Julian, it'll be the evening brief. Why not? We'll just keep all, we're creating a whole franchise real time in Yahoo Finance. Yeah. But two things that stood out to me, one was our chat with BNY Mellon CEO Robin Vince, talking about how tokenization, mm -hmm. uh, something I don't think a lot of people are familiar with, potentially changing the banking industry. And then a lot of leaders, of course, talking about uh, potential next Trump presidency. I just wish somebody would say, you know what? It just won't be good for markets. We're not getting that yet, though. We're not really getting that because, you know, given what we saw last time when Trump won, one and there was even the markets had trouble pricing it in for a little while so i think people don't want to go out and make that kind of prediction yeah I, I think a lot will agree though that uh maybe it might be unhealthy for the u.s economy i'm teeing off for the next guest here julie unhealthy well uh -huh. oh unhealthy there we healthy go. There we go. i get right. it all right we're making health puns here yes. at yahoo finance took me a little while to pick up on that uh, let's talk about the intersection of one of the big themes here in davos with healthcare, that is AI and healthcare. That was part of our conversation, for example, with Bill Gates the other day, where he talked about the way that AI is informing healthcare discoveries, drug discovery, for example. So let's bring in Novartis CEO Vasnar Simon to talk more about this. I mean, it's AI everything here at Davos this year, Voss. Thank you so much. It does for feel like here. an AI conference. Yeah, it really it does. does. Yeah. I mean, you know, are you guys using AI yet when it comes to things like drug discovery? And I, I guess I mean specifically generative AI, because that's usually what we're talking about now. Yeah, we, we've been in actually generative AI for a number of years. We signed a collaboration with Microsoft, Microsoft Research Labs, even three, four years ago, where we're, we developed an approach called generative chemistry to try to speed up how fast we can bring new medicines into the clinic. Last week, we announced a partnership with Isomorphic Labs, which is a spin out of DeepMind from Google, to also see how can we, again, speed up our ability to drug new potential targets for new medicines. I would say it's early days. I mean, the hype cycle here is quite, quite strong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are very powerful tools. When you look at what DeepMind did with their AlphaFold library, which teaches us how proteins fold, I mean, this is now widely used in research. It's really opening up new horizons. But we still need to see the proof in humans that this is actually going to lead to faster drugs. How does this impact the pipeline of drugs you will bring to market over the next five years? Or, or does it impact it at all yet? It won't impact the next five years. Impacting the next five years is how AI is going to impact many of our productivity efforts in drug development. How fast can we generate new trial protocols? How fast can we work with regulators? How fast can we look at patient safety, look at pa large patient data sets? Not necessarily, I would call it, I mean, it is generative AI, but maybe not the most cutting edge generative AI. But those, those areas will hopefully give us six months, maybe, maybe nine months. But if we want some of the big gains, that's going to take longer. Um, if the buzzword here in Davos is AI, I think that it's safe to say the buzzword last year in healthcare broadly was GLP-1, right. right? This is not an area where you guys are, are active. Um, and as a pharmaceutical company, how do you decide kind of when you do want to yeah. get on that, that big next train? You know, one of the things we've learned, and we talked about this last year, Julie, we've been on this, this journey to really become a focused company. We focus $130 billion of deals, focused down to be pure play medicines, focused on four therapeutic areas. And in each of those therapeutic areas, we decide which diseases we want to play in. Obesity has not historically been one of them. So it's very tempting to get into the GLP race. 
but rather we say focus on what we're really good at. And when you look at last year, we had 10 positive phase three readouts across cancer, immunology, kidney diseases, where we are one of the leaders. And so I think we're going to stay the course and maybe something, some breakthroughs will happen in our research lab down the line. Maybe AI will generate us a better obesity drug. We'll see. Uh, but I think the discipline of focus is what's delivering for results. And that's what we want to want to continue doing. Well, you're the perfect person then since you're not in this market to ask, is this a sustainable trend? And I asked that because we had a great conversation with PepsiCo CEO, Ramon LaGuarta, and he acknowledged that weight loss drugs are maybe impacting the business just a little bit on the fringes, sure. but dismissed any longer term impact. How do you see it? It's early days. Look, I mean, when you look at other segments where you're trying to prevent diseases for the long run, if you look at the data on how many people take their statins, their statins to lower their cholesterol, if they've already had a heart attack, so these are patients had a heart attack, want to keep their cholesterol low, low only 30% of patients are compliant with their statins. So now we ask the question, you get, we're now in the early days, people are seeing the weight loss. It's a lifelong therapy. You've got to stay on it. It'll be interesting to see how many patients stay on two years out, three years out. And then what is the impact if you fall off? You've lost muscle mass. How is that going to impact your health? So there's a lot of open questions. There's no question that these drugs are extraordinary at losing weight in the short term. Now now the question is how will people stay on these drugs for the long term? Do you think they, if they do that there's also potential ripple effects for other areas where you guys do, um, where you are active, for ca cancer for example? Hard to say on cancer, certainly in cardiovascular disease yeah. is something we've been thinking about. Uh, and what we have really seen so far in the data is, and that's important to remind people from a public health standpoint, this isn't magic. I mean, you still need to be careful about what you eat on cholesterol and triglycerides. This is a separate risk factor than being obese. You need to look at other genetic risk factors that we work on, something called LP little a. And so you've got to balance all of these things. If you just think this is magic and now I can do whatever I want, those other risks still remain. So I think as long as that those risks are independent, our drug pipeline will, will continue to, to prosper. There's been a lot of attention paid lately to M&A that you guys I heard. might potentially <laughs> be doing or not doing. Then it seemed like maybe you're not. I mean, can you give us some clarity on what's going on with you guys? Yeah, you know, we have a focused M&A strategy. As I mentioned, we have a strong pipeline, 10 positive phase threes. We did have a really strong year last year. So M&A is really complementing our portfolio. If you look at the 15 deals we did last year, all sub $3 billion, sub $4 billion deals, and that's where our focus has been. Now, we evaluate larger companies, and I think that's why, of course, uh, you, you see coverage. Um, but, you know, our focus remains on the smaller companies. We don't want to comment on independent deals, but really we think where we ha have a sweet spot is sub $5 billion deals. A lot of these we're talking to here uh, are concerned. They're voicing their concern about a potential next Trump presidency. Now, in that last administration, Trump presidency, science was under attack. Uh, and a lot of what was happening in the drug discovery industry and, of course, COVID vaccines. Should President Trump be reelected? Are you concerned that science comes under attack? And what impact does that have to your business? I would say in general, I am concerned generally about the attacks on science. And certainly, depending on who the next administration is, you, you have concerns that there'll be a further erosion in trust in medical science. And so I think we're going to have to be sure that we have strong voices to educate the public. I also think it's important also to watch how the Senate and the House unfold, because I think that will also you know, be important to really see how policy is ultimately shaped in the U.S. in the, in the coming years. Um, for us, most important is that we resolve IRA for the pharmaceutical industry. We continue to believe that the 9 and, and 13 disparities on certain drugs will make it hard to develop cancer drugs that are, that are given orally, cardiovascular drugs that are given orally and I think what you're going to see over the next five to seven years if we don't get this policy fixed is those drugs will start to disappear from our pipelines mm. and then at the end of the decade patients will be asking where are these next waves of medicines so I'm hoping we can get that fixed regardless of which administration takes on all right we'll leave it there uh, for now Voss Narsen and Novartis CEO you've been a longtime guest of Yahoo Finance here at Davos we greatly appreciate it thank yeah, you so much great to be here, guys. appreciate thank it you. All right, much more ahead from uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Coming up, we'll talk to our friend of the show, Jan Hatzius, uh, Goldman Sachs chief economist. Looking forward to hearing what he has to say in reaction to that really hot or pretty hot retail sales report this morning. We'll be right back.
About 12 minutes here until the opening bell. Let's get to three stocks that are on the move here this morning in pre-market trading. We're hearing from the regional banks, Charles Schwab, U.S. Bancorp, and Citizens Financial all out with their quarterly results. And you can see downward pressure on all three of these names. Charles Schwab now off nearly 6% ahead of the open. Madison Mills standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the latest on this. And Maddie, once again, we're seeing some weakness in some of these regional plays. That's exactly right, Shauna. And it's all about that net interest income. And also, it's all about the revenue picture. And when you look at Schwab this morning, that is what the street is focused on. And that's why we're seeing some negativity in that name. I want to run through just a couple of the numbers here. Fourth quarter net interest income declining by nearly half at about 48%. That is a huge dip in that area from the previous quarter and what the consensus was for this name. Uh, earnings topping consensus despite that net income number deposits as well and this has been a key thing to watch across all of these banks down by 21 percent and that story continues into my other stock to watch this morning u.s bank corp the consensus on the yahoo finance platform was at the lowest that it's been in the past five quarters for this name and we did see some disappointment for usb as well particularly when it comes to those deposits down by 10 percent but interestingly revenue was still up by six percent for u.s bank corp and then finally, I want to end on Morgan Stanley struggling in a very similar way to these other banks here. Uh, again, it's about that forward guidance, and that's where we're seeing a lot of negativity towards Morgan Stanley coming out of yesterday and into today's trade as well. I want to take a quick look at the KBW Bank Index because we'll be able to get a clearer look at how this entire basket of names is performing. That index is down a little over 1% on my end this morning pre-market. And what's interesting to note is that that higher interest rates, that used to be a good thing for these banks because it meant that they could charge more interest. But in today's environment, that means that uh, folks are pulling their money out. They're going into money market funds. They're investing in bonds. And that's why we're seeing that downward pressure on deposits killing these banks and earnings. All right, Maddie, thanks so much for teeing that up. We're going to be watching all those names going into the opening cross and throughout the trading session. Yahoo yeah, Finance's own Maddie Mills. We'll check back in with you at the NYSC in just a little bit. Let's also take a look at some trending tickers we're watching today. Disney has nominated 12 people to its board of directors, formally rejecting the ones put forward by Nelson Peltz. The media giant also disclosed CEO Bob Iger's compensation, which doubled in 2023. There you're taking a look at shares pre-market. They're down by about seven tenths of a percent. What they had mentioned within this is that the board does not endorse the nomination of Nelson Peltz and James Rasulo put forth by Tryon Fund Management. However, of course, some of the notable figures that are the ones that were put forward by the brand, everyone from uh, Lululemon CEO Calvin McDonald. You've got, of course, the uh, G uh, GM CEO as well, Mary Barra in there. And then additionally, uh, Mark Parker, who is uh, one of the noted and famed former CEOs of Nike as well here. Yeah, Safra Katz, also among them, CEO of Oracle. Yeah. You have the former CEO of Morgan Stanley, uh, James Gorman. But talking about why Disney... Uh, fighting back against Iger and taking issue with him being named as one of the board members here. There's a couple of interesting uh, points that I wanted to call it here, just in terms of why Disney rejected Peltz's board seat. A couple of things. They didn't, he did not disclose one strategic idea for Disney. This is according to Disney's board. His assessment of Disney seemed oblivious to the ongoing secular change in the media industry. They also went on to say that he doesn't have much experience in media and technology sectors, and also some concerns about how the partnership with Perlmutter, his uh, relationship relationship there. We know that Perlmutter has a very complex past with Iger and with other Disney executives. So exactly how that is going to impact Peltz's agenda with Disney with some of the issues that Disney really brought to light in this rejection of Peltz and his proposal should be one of the names that nominated to this board. I also want to point out what Bob Iger said in a letter to investors yesterday, just reiterating the vision that he has for Disney, saying that once again, he wants to make the streaming business profitable. Obviously, that has been a top priority for Iger and for the team at Disney here over the last several quarters. We've heard about that time and time again during earnings calls, but also turning ESPN into that preeminent digital platform, really elevating what they already have right now, the content that they have at ESPN, transitioning that to the next era of media and exactly what that looks like is one of the big questions here, one of the big focal points for shareholders. As we know, we're taking a look at that one-year chart of Disney. We are off the 52-week low that we did see back in November, but not too far off. It's still off about 6% 
in the last 52 weeks. So there is a heck of a lot of pressure on Disney to right size the business. The question, though, is how long is that turnaround going to take to play out? And how much does Bob Iger make, continue yes. to make in compensation in that turnaround strategy? Heck of a lot of money, right? $31.6 million dollars last year. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at Tesla because Tesla once again slashing prices. This time in Germany, the EV maker cutting prices of its Model Y in the country after previously pulling back on the cost of its Model Y and Model 3 vehicles in China. That was announced last week. We brought that news to you. We're seeing some pressure on the stock here this morning, off about 2%. The reason why, and one of the issues that analysts have talked about time and time again here at Yahoo Finance, is the price cuts, what exactly that's going to do to margins, the pressure that that could then put on margins. We've seen that over the last couple of quarters here for Tesla. And it looks like as these price words play out on a global scale, that's something Tesla is going to con continue to contend with. I mean, as we see this kind of pullback in EV demand right now, what you're seeing is price cuts as a demand generation mechanism from the auto manufacturers right now, and none more so than Tesla, because their structure is vastly different. It's not a million dealerships that are around the world that are pumping all of these different vehicles that have been produced and delivered to some of those dealers on a regional basis through their own cost mechanisms that can have more of a one-on-one -on -one relation for each sale. For Tesla, it's online and it's being able to go into certain malls to be able to place some of those orders or at least find out more about what the vehicle can do. What was interesting is even now we're getting more data year over year about where the used car sales of some of these vehicles are going. Carvana came out with some data this morning. Uh, they said within its top 10 best selling EVs of 2023, two of those, two of the top three were Tesla. The Tesla Model 3 was the number one. And there you're taking a look at uh, one through five there. Tesla has two of those positions. And then even if you go out to the top 10, Tesla has four of those top 10 positions within those sales too. Speaking of vehicles and cars and mobility, Ford shares, they're heading downhill after UBS downgraded the stock from buy to neutral, saying the automaker has more to reverse than its peers when it comes to execution and quality challenges here. You're taking a look at shares down 2.4% on this, what they mentioned is that while Ford is subject to the same industry headwinds as other automakers, pricing, affordability, labor, investment, and trying to increase their capital efficiency, they believe Ford may have more to reverse versus peers considering execution and quality challenges. That's uh, what the analyst was saying here in this note. Yeah, and I think this just goes along the lines of what we have been talking about now for several weeks, the demand there, the growth in EVs simply not living up to what many of the forecasters had expected that to look like. We've seen a number of these automakers Ford included adjust their plans as a result of this. And so now UBS, the analyst there, Joe Spack, coming out saying that he's downgrading the company because he thinks this transition is going to take a little bit more time to play out. It's also important to point out that if you're a shareholder of Ford, it hasn't been exactly a great year for you. Taking a look at that one-year chart, shares are off just about 6% since the start of the year. Taking a look at one year, it's also been under a bit of pressure. We know CEO Jim Farley has had to adjust his plans over the last several months and exactly the build-out that he initially had anticipated here for Ford has uh, changed over the last uh, several weeks. So the one-year chart, you're looking at Ford shares off just about 10%. So a name to keep on your radar here throughout today's trading day. All right, we'll keep right here on the morning brief here at Yahoo Finance. We've got much more for you. The opening bell on Wall Street. We're also going back over to Davos for the latest coverage of the World Economic Forum. We'll be right back.
And there you have it, the opening bell on Wall Street. You're taking a live look at the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ as we see the ringing of the bells. Again, taking a look at the broader market action here. A bit of pressure across the three major averages here at the open following that solid or better than expected econ data that we got out ahead of the open with retail sales. Also, the reading that we're getting for December industrial production. So it looks like good news for the economy, at least bad news for stocks today. A lot of that having to do with expectation of the Fed and rate cuts. Let's get over to Mass in the middle, standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the latest on that. Maddie. All right, All right it sorry about that, you guys. It's so loud here at the NICE this morning. It was hard for me to tell whether or not you were throwing to me. But listen, the story here at the NICE this morning is what rate cuts. Certainly not going to get them in March. We're seeing that the swaps market pricing in about an 80% chance of that yesterday. Now it's down to about 60%. And it's looking like June is also a question mark. That's what I'm hearing from my sources here at the Stock Exchange this morning. Now, in terms of how that's defining today's trade, I want to get a look at the numbers here. We're seeing negativity across the board, right? The Dow Jones down about four tenths of a percent, S&P seven tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq down eight tenths of a percent. I imagine some of that is due to the negativity that we're seeing in Apple and some of those big tech names dragging down those sectors. But when we look at the Treasury market, the two-year yield hitting over 4.3 percent, the dollar hitting its highs for the month again after hitting record highs yesterday, that spells higher for longer. And I'm I'm also looking at the VIX right here to my right at the stock exchange hitting its highest highs since November. That indicates a little bit of confusion in today's trade and some of that volatility coming back into the trade here. Again, a sea of red across those big tech names is going to be pulling down today's trade. I'm looking ahead to Fed speak today. We've got Williams coming up. Will we hear a repeat of what we saw yesterday with Waller and will that pour even more cold water on the idea of rate cuts to come. All right, Maddie Mills, thank you so much. Uh, from mountain charts back over to the mountains in the Swiss Alps, Brian, Julie standing by in Davos, Switzerland for day three of the World Economic Forum. Hey, guys. All right, thanks so much, Brad. As you can imagine, lots of focus on the U.S. economy and the global economy here at the World Economic Forum. We have a special guest to talk about all of those things. Jan Hatzi is Goldman Sachs, chief economist. Jan, we consume enough of your research at Yahoo Finance. Good to see you in person. It's wonderful to see you both. All right, so I think the market has been on a little bit of a rough patch the past five sessions, and that comes after hot CPI. Retail sales this morning, a little bit hottish. And I think that has a lot of investors concerned about the pace of rate cuts. How do you see it? There has been some, I think, you know, pairing back of rate cut expectations because we have had, you know, somewhat hotter numbers on the CPI, although not not by a lot. But clearly, the retail sales numbers were firm. Some of the policymaker commentary was probably a little bit more cautionary than markets had expected. And when exactly we're going to get to rate cuts is, of course, still uncertain. Markets have been priced for a lot of cuts in 2024 in the U.S., as many as seven cuts at one point. And there's been some, some pullback from that. But ultimately, the driver of rate cuts, in my view, is what happens to inflation. And the disinflationary trend cutting through the monthly ups and downs, that's still very much intact. In fact, even if you look at the December numbers, which... You know, we have the CPI, we have the PPI last week. You take both of those together, we're actually getting a pretty friendly core PCE number, even for December, below 0.2%. And I think that is going to keep the Fed and other central banks on the path towards rate cuts. So our baseline for the Fed is March. It could be May. Our baseline for the European Central Bank is April. Our baseline for the Bank of England is, is May. So all of those, we think, are going to get going relatively soon, assuming our broad view on inflation is correct. Jan, um, here at the World Economic Forum, there are a lot of other chief economists you know, wandering around, central bankers, world leaders, CEOs. Is there anything that you have heard here that has surprised you or challenged your assumptions about the pace of global growth? Well, I would say the central bankers, and this is also true in what you, you see from them publicly, are not endorsing 
the idea that we're going to get cuts in the next several months. And I mean, if I were a central banker, I'd probably also be a little bit more non-committal until I was actually ready to cut pretty soon, because you box yourself in by endorsing what is you know, a fairly clear statement of where markets think things are going. So I think the central banker commentary has been sort of consistent with that. Otherwise, in terms of how the way, the way that people talk about the economy, it's more optimistic than it's been in a long time. And of course, that's been colored by the fact that last year turned out to be much stronger and much friendlier than, than many people had expected. When you go through a period where the surprises to consensus expectations are strongly in one direction or the other, what you hear at gatherings like this one is going to reflect that. Yeah. If, uh, if economic data continues to surprise to the upside, Jan, do you think we get to the point in the first half of the year where we start realizing maybe we don't get any rate cuts in the U.S. this year? Well, again, I think if you have decent growth, and we you know, certainly expect decent growth, we have a 2.3% forecast for U.S. GDP growth for 2020. Four, that is one percentage point above the consensus. So that's definitely part of our view. But the driver of rate cuts in our forecast, and I would say in what Chair Powell said in the December press conference, is that inflation is coming back down to the target. If inflation comes back down to the target, there will very likely also be rate cuts because a five and three eighths federal funds rate is going to just seem very, very high relative to an economy that's producing a 2% inflation rate. So my answer would be probably you'd still get cuts, even if the economy holds up pretty well, because weakness in growth and recession is not the only way to get, get to rate cuts, especially if you're talking about moderate rate cuts. Um, two of the big topics here in Davos that we've, uh, in conversations we've been having with people, the U.S. election and AI. So I want to talk to you about the effect of those on the economy. Let's take elections first. What does the U.S. economy look like under a Biden presidency, under another Trump presidency? I mean, I think a lot depends on, you know, what happens not just in the presidential election, which of course is very difficult to predict, but also what happens in the congressional elections, whether one side has unified control. If you have unified control, there's typically a lot more fiscal policy leg legislation than if you have divided government. Now, unified control is more likely to be unified Republican control, given the Senate map. I think there's a you know, strong, I'm not a political prog prognosticator, but I think there's a strong belief that Republicans have an advantage because they have fewer vulnerable senators up for, for re-election. So if you were to see unified Republican control, chances are that there would be more fiscal legislation. There's a round of tax cuts that were passed back in 2017 that expire at the end of 2025. And uh, I think you'd have a higher chance of basically having all of that or, or pretty much all of that extended. And so that would probably be, you know, a driver of somewhat higher growth, maybe some upward pressure on rates. I think there's an expectation that it probably would be a somewhat dollar strengthening. Um, so that's one, one thing to focus on. Um, you know, another thing to focus on is what happens in the run up to the election. Is that going to have a major impact on that? I'm more skeptical. In the past, we've not really seen, you know, major effects of impending elections on economic activity or even on Fed policy. That's another question that often often comes. There's, it's actually not easy to document significant effects on, on Fed policy. And so our, our Fed views are also not really driven by, by these factors. Lastly, uh, before I let you go on the AI front, I think Goldman several months ago published a potential or just a look at what could happen to the job market because of uh, AI spreading. Now that you're at a conference like this, there's so much talk of AI. Do you stick by those numbers or do you think we might see more job displacement from it? Well, what we have found is that the impact of AI, you know, on a 10, 15 year horizon, I'm, talk I'm not talking about next year, I'm talking about a much longer time horizon, on the job market is potentially very sizable 
if you look at the total number of work hours that could be replaced by, by AI, we, we get numbers in the range of 25%, again, over a long period, because AI replaces lower and mid-level administrative programming, research support types of services. And, and the modern economy, whether in the US or in Europe, I mean, these are important parts of the, the labor market. However, we also find that in most cases, it's complements rather than substitutes in the sense that, you know, maybe we all get 10 or 20 percent of our time back. And that, uh, you know, is important, but it doesn't, you know, put most people out of a job. There will be a group of people, of course, that uh, will be out of a job because more than 50 percent of their time gets replaced. And society is going to have to find ways of reintegrating those workers into the, into the economy. That's our view. Nothing that I've seen here has you know, necessarily dissuaded me from that. But it's going to be, I think, a, a very, very important economic development, though perhaps a little bit more backloaded than many people are saying. Right. Everybody's very excited about it here. Jan, thank you so much for, for joining us with your perspective. I appreciate it. Jan Hatzius, Chief Economist at Goldman Sachs. And guys, coming up next, we are going to hear from Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins. Guess what? We'll be talking about AI. So keep it right here on Yahoo Finance for much more from Davos. All right, Charles Schwab, Citizens Financial and U.S. Bancorp are among the top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance this morning. The regional banks out with mixed quarterly results as they wrap up what has been a tumultuous year for the industry. The big decliner of the morning is Charles Schwab. Now that stock having its worst day since March after reporting net new assets fell nearly 50 percent on the year. That fell short of the street's expectations. You're looking at a drop of nearly 7 percent. Joining us now is Nathan Stovall. He's S&P Global Market Intelligence Director of Financial Institutions Research. Nathan, it's great to have you. So lots to unpack here. Let's first start with the results that we're getting out from Charles Schwab. Again, pressure on the stock off nearly 7 percent in early trading. It certainly has been a very challenging year for the industry. Is the worst behind Schwab and some of its competitors? Well, I, I think it's just a continued grind. I don't know if we've seen anything necessarily that surprising out of this quarterly results. Uh, we, we've seen continued pressure on deposits, continued pressure on liquidity, and really a reminder that higher for longer rate environment is here. 
we'd seen a big pop for the entire group as the prospect of more rate cuts from the Fed coming in the second half of 24 was was getting higher up on the table. And as we just heard from one of the last guests, that now that the market is maybe backing off of that a little bit, moving away from that six to seven cuts, uh, maybe closer to three or four. And that's what we kind of assumed in our forecast. And I think that's what you're seeing is you're seeing continued pressure on on funding costs uh, across the board. That's very much what we expected and and seeing banks defend their deposits with higher rates and think that continues to play out. So some of this, I think, is just a little bit of the market getting a little bit ahead of itself in terms of the expectation of, of a Fed pivot and maybe hoping that some of that pressure would subside. Uh, but pretty decent results, I, I think, from from most across the board, albeit with some headwinds on, on the funding side and and slower loan growth, uh, but but nothing really terribly worrying from from the credit side, which is a, is a big marker for the street right now as well. Nathan, on aggregates, the provisions for loan losses or, or credit losses, that, that's certainly come up a few times at this point during the early moments of the earnings season, especially as we focus in on banks. Big banks last week, regional banks this week. How does that have perhaps a more profound impact on some of the regional banks, though? Sure. I mean, that's the area that is really in focus. The street has been very concerned about their exposure to commercial real estate in, in particular. But thus far, we really haven't seen anything that would look any different than call it normalization and credit trends. Because remember, the group's really been over earning on credit. And what I mean by that is they've had very little loss content in form of charge off activity and provisions have been historically low. And you're seeing both come up, uh, but come off, off off of such low basis. And, and we haven't really heard anybody say anything that is really worrying. They're still in that normalization camp, moving back towards call it pre-pandemic levels. The consumer remains resilient, and and the CRE piece is is definitely one that we're watching really closely. But it's going to take a while. It's not going to be one quarter, or even two quarters. It's going to be sort of a multi-year shift, and I I think the street still hasn't quite fully appreciated that, particularly when you look at the regionals. The other thing I would say too, when you look at their exposures, you need to have a little bit more nuance in assuming that everything is a, a an office skyscraper. <laughs> they, they might be some specific different subcategories within that asset class that will perform way differently. And you even have some stuff that might even be office loans that a regional holds that has nothing to do about a return to work conversation. If you're talking about local medical, like a dentist office or, or you know, even a doctor's office. Nathan, as we move past some of the current challenges, some of the current headwinds in the market, and as we look uh, further ahead down the road, there is, of course, what the impact is going to be on some of the higher credit costs and the impact that that is going to have uh, specifically on some of these regional plays. What is that going to look like in terms of the pressure that we could see on earnings? And is it going to be, are some of these banks going to be able to weather what could be a pretty tumultuous uh, couple of quarters there for them? Sure, and we do have that expectation that you're gonna see notably higher credit costs, both in the form of, of higher charge-off activity and banks continue to build reserves. But we think it's a manageable hit broadly. And it's a headwind earnings. And so it's really an earnings discussion rather than a safety and soundness discussion for the vast majority of institutions. Uh, I, I think you might have some outliers there, you know, that, that could absolutely happen. And you'll have some that don't perform a, as well. Uh, but broadly speaking, we, we think this is more akin to, to a modest downturn than anything really severe. And it will just play out over time. The other thing I would say is when you look at the valuations of the sector, yes, they've, they've ripped up in December uh, off of the lows that we saw earlier in 23, but they're still historically cheap relative to the S&P 500. So some of that deterioration, you could say, is already baked into the valuation. Nathan, uh, we got to go, but just with the 15 seconds that we have left, we've got most recently out of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a plan that's been proposed to curb overdraft fees from banks. What's the read through to the regional banks as we've been discussing, or, or perhaps even more so to some of the big banks as the administration sounds keen to go after this? Sure. Well, I mean, that, that, that's a hit to, to earnings. They they make money on fees uh, due, due to overdraft fees. And, and the CFPB has been pretty clear that they're going to be firmly focused on going after that and trying to curb that. And I put that in the camp of what we think is is much more intense regulatory enforcement post liquidity crunch in March. And all that serves as a, as a headwind for earnings. I think it's modest. It, it's something that the banks will be able to digest. 
but it is going to be a headwind and I don't think it's going to go away. I, you know, that might feel like a long time ago what we saw in March of 23, but the CFPB in particular is laser focused on, on curbing those fees. But I think regulators broadly want to make sure that banks are liquid, safe and sound. And we think they are, but th th that'll lead into their earnings modestly. Nathan, always a pleasure to get some of your insights on the sector. Nathan Stovall, who is the S&P Global Market Intelligence Director of Financial Institutions Research. Thanks so much. Thank you. Certainly. Well, the story that we've been tracking here this morning, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau unveiling its long-awaited changes to overdraft fees at America's biggest banks. The rule would apply to insured institutions with over $10 billion in assets, covering the 175 largest banks in the country. The independent watchdog agency made two proposals. One, overdraft loans could be treated like credit cards, making them subject to the Truth in Lending Act. Or two, overdraft protection could be a courtesy but can't drive profits. Banks would be able to charge a fee in line with their costs with the CFPB, uh, CFPB excuse me, proposing benchmark fees of $3, $6, $7, or $14 a year. What was noted in the statement from President Biden was that the proposal would cut the average overdraft fee by more than half, saving the typical American family, they say, that pays these fees $150 a year. And what this adds up to is roughly $3.5 billion by their calculation every year. Yeah, it was amazing. I was taking a look at some of these numbers. The CFPB, according to their recent data, just to put the size and scope of this issue in perspective uh, for everyone out there, since 2000, American consumers have paid an estimated $280 billion, $280 billion in bank overdraft fees. So it certainly is an activity or a uh, approach here from the banks that they do tend to profit off, especially when you take into account the average overdraft fee yeah. is right around 35 bucks. And like you said, Brad, this has been a priority for the Biden administration. So this proposal taking it one step further. So they're not fully eliminating overdraft fees, but they're just lowering it for the banks to only be able to charge what they are then paying in terms of the cost for them, which would certainly be a huge weight off a lot of consumers back because, yes, some people aren't affected by these, but for other people, if you're continually getting charged $35, it could certainly have a massive impact. Hello, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. I was certainly giving them a lot of coinage over uh, over some of my younger years. I don't know. I might have given some recently, too. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Well, certainly something to add to keep on your radar there. And then also, like we were just talking about with our last guest, in the guest and the impact that it could have on earnings here coming up in the coming quarters. All right. Well, coming up, the morning brief is going back across the Atlantic to Davos Switzerland, a conversation with Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins. That's coming up next. We'll be right back. It's January and it's cold in New York City. So the Yahoo Finance team is packing up its skis and investing knowledge and heading to the Swiss slopes for the World Economic Forum in Davos. I know what you're thinking, folks. It's colder there in Switzerland, but myself, Julie Hyman, and the Yahoo Finance live team plan to heat things up with some big-time interviews with the who's who of global business. The so-called Masters of the Universe will convene around the theme of rebuilding trust. There's no trust issues here. You can rely on us to ask the most important questions to the world's most high-profile leaders. Is the world more divided than it has ever been before? Is AI really bigger than the Internet? Is this year's huge election cycle the risk we've all been missing? Will the bull market in stocks end really badly? You won't miss anything with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Yahoo Finance Live and the Yahoo Finance platform from top leaders in the banking, pharma, and crypto sectors to access the world's foremost academics and some policymakers for good measure. We've got you covered. Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos starts on Tuesday, January 16th. You don't want to miss it. Lots of focus on all things AI here at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Let's keep that AI conversation going with Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins. Chuck, always nice to get some time with you. Good what are we here. missing on AI? <laughs> uh, tell us. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Okay. You've been right. to, you, you, you have to know everything about it at this point yes, with exactly. all, all the discussions this week. You know, I think, uh, look, I think it's incredibly early. I mean, with with AI right now, and uh, everybody's trying to speculate. But I, I think if you go back, think about when the iPhone launched. And, and we had no idea what applications were ultimately going to show up on that iPhone and the things that we were able to do with it and the use cases that came. And I think we're sort of in that same phase right now, particularly with enterprise use cases. I think our customers are really trying to, I think we know some that make a lot of sense like customer service and contact center and 
creating new interfaces to technology that are more language driven as opposed to typing on a on a command line. Um, assistants that help you with you know with with different technologies where you, it helps walk you through what to be think how to be thinking about uh, possible outcomes or possible causes of things that are going on. All that stuff I think we we expect and we're working on right now. But the big killer enterprise. Uh, applications, I think, are yet to be determined. I was walking down the promenade this morning, and everyone has a window, and they all have these big TVs showing off demos of something, and yeah. I'm sure it's backed <laughs> up by large language models supporting something. <laughs> all these companies can't win, right, Chuck? Yeah. There is going to be a shakeout, right? Of course. What does of that course. look like? Well, I think if you if you look at the foundation, and I'm not an expert on the, this stuff, so the guys that you're talking to are, are clearly probably uh, more in, with the details, but what what I believe is that the large language models that are largely being built off of available information, sucking information from the internet, over time you're gonna get the information loaded and they're gonna be effective and, and they'll, they'll be generally, I think even uh, uh, Sam Altman even said that it'll, it'll go to zero and commoditize. I think the ones that are gonna win are gonna be the ones that figure out how do I create value-based capabilities that help end users take advantage of the data they have and how do I help them actually turn that into something more valuable than it is today. And I've met with a couple of companies that are doing some really interesting stuff right now that um, I think are thinking that way and uh, we'll be partnering with a lot of them because of our enterprise presence. So I think that's how it's going to play out. And, and you said that um, the way the AI might inform your business is that there'll be more demand for networking equipment because there'll be more demand for compute because of AI, right? So kind of- it's one way. Yeah, yeah so, so talk to me about that way specifically first and then we can get into the other ways. Like where are we in that adoption cycle? So how technical do you want to go? Um, so, <laughs> not so, too, not too. So let's take NVIDIA as an example. Today NVIDIA sells their GPUs and they have a, a networking technology that they, they sell with it. It's called InfiniBand. And most of the web scale players and others who are building these large language models want to, want to use Ethernet instead of InfiniBand. They want to use a standard technology. There's some special features that we need in Ethernet to make that viable, but we're now running Ethernet underneath the GPUs in pilot phase in a lot of the web scale players today. And so that's a big opportunity for us because as they build that out and we get this technology uh, underneath, then every time the GPUs go in, you're gonna see you know our technology underneath it. Then the enterprise is really trying to figure out, you're gonna have, you're gonna need to build a stack of technology that allows customers to, to take small amounts of their data and, and put it at the edge of their enterprise closer to where the customer is, and they're gonna to wanna to run inference models, and so we'll be, we're working on designing what that might look like. In many cases, partnering with the GPU players with our technology. So it's, a, it's still early, but I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity there. And then you got all the issues of security right. that have to be dealt with. Outside of, uh, I know the Splunk deal, you're still working through that, but Cisco, for decades, has been a major acquirer of very large businesses. I mean, it's how the company has got to the point where it is today. I mean, do you look at some of these companies on the promenade, and, I think, wow, this could be a feeding frenzy over the next decade. Yeah, I just can't afford any of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the valuation's too high for the, some of these the companies. Value, some of the valuations, I think, are, are insane, but, I mean, that's what the market's... The market is the market, right? Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, and part of the reason, if you, you know, I made a comment earlier this week about the valuations relative to their revenue, but the, the reality is is that to get started in these businesses requires so much capital that the valuations are just naturally going up because of the amount of capital that's being infused to build out the underlying technology infrastructure. So I do understand how it's happened. I just don't know how it ends. Um, and, uh, but no, I think you're right. We've made, we've made several acquisitions in our security portfolio and in our collaboration portfolio that we have just gained incredible AI talent. So we're pretty excited about that. So I think we will see us continue to do that. One of the other things we've been talking about is companies have been around for a while. They're undergoing some changes. The Splunk acquisition and, and when that closes, that'll be a change for you guys. You're trying to diversify a little more into services, as I understand software, it. Software, yeah. Software, um, you know, away from the, the um, traditional business for you guys. So what does Cisco look like <laughs> five years from now? Well, we we've been we've been working on this transition, and when we cl when we close Splunk, I think our software business will be somewhere around 22 billion, and so we've made a lot of progress. And, and I don't know if that makes us number five or six or something in the world, but uh, you know, at the same time, we still have a pretty meaningful hardware business, and and the internet needs us to be a a, a really good hardware company, because all the technology that that uh, that we need to 
to continue to support all the increased traffic that we see around the world. So I think you're just going to see both sides continue to increase. I think as this AI thing explodes, my expectation is that our infrastructure equipment that goes with it will also go up. Uh, and we'll continue to invest in our software assets and add more software assets to it where we can. Uh, we've talked to a lot of leaders here so far at the conference, and I think they know a little bit about AI, but for many of them, this is, this is new, and mm. it might be more new stuff coming at them tomorrow. As a leader, how are you staying informed mm. about a technology that wasn't around 20 years ago, and things might be different a week from now? Yeah, we, we have a couple, we have about three of my direct reports are pretty deep in it, and so they, they give us primers almost every week on what's going on, what's changing, how things are evolving. Um, and so we just, we spend a lot of time with them educating the rest of the team. And we're, we're building, we're now building a plan to how, for how do we educate different aspects of the company on how they should be thinking about it. Uh, I've asked every function inside the company to give me their plan for how generative AI is going to fundamentally change the productivity or whatever, the, the, whatever they do. And so everybody's working through that as well. So it's just, it's all educational as we go. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins, thanks for giving us time at Davos. Like always, we appreciate it. Great to see you guys. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live, everyone. We're staying locked in over here. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. All right, well, taking a look at some of those individual names. Again, there is some pressure across the board when you're taking a look at some of those major averages. But individual names, let's start with Manchester. Manchester United's exit from the lucrative Champions League is going to cost the football club. The company out with its first update since billionaire Jim Ratcliffe bought a stake in the company. That was revealed at the end of December. But Man U lowering its sales forecast for the year now expects revenue between $805 million, $843 million. The reason for this is because of the early exit from the Champions League and the purse that you would get if you did win that. So uh, potentially, it, and it does look like a big uh, financial hit here for the company. Absolutely. Also, we're tracking Barclays today, issuing a downgrade on Solar Edge today. It's lowering its outlook to underweight from equal weight and also cutting its price target by almost a quarter to 50 dollars from 74 dollars. The reason slower anticipated growth this year and the need for price reductions. 
All right, in Prologis, a real estate play that invests in logistics facilities out with mixed quarterly results. Also warning of economic and geopolitical uncertainty for the year ahead. Now, despite this caution, though, Prologis did raise its full year earnings guidance and now expects $3.20 a share to $3.45 per share for earnings per share. All right, we want to move on to some retail sales here this morning. Do you guys first want to do home builders? Producers? Okay. Let's get to some breaking news here first. The National Association of Home Builders Confidence report is out. Builder confidence rising in January. This is the second consecutive monthly increase in builder confidence. Mortgage rates decreasing since late October. The future sales hit gauge hit positive territory for the first time since August. The NAHB reported that despite decreasing mortgage rates, builders continue to reduce home prices to boost sales. Now, 31% of builders reported cutting home prices. That's down from that's down 5% from the previous month. So 31% of home builders here cutting prices in January. They're doing this to spur demand. Yes, we have seen, Brad, some improvement on mortgage rates. They have come down since peaking back in October, but still on a year-over-year comparison base, especially when you compare it to the rates that we saw during the pandemic, significantly higher from what potential uh, home buyers or home buyers were paying during that time. So they need to uh, offer some incentives here in order to boost uh, sales. We're seeing that. That has been a trend now for quite some time. But again, home builder confidence, it looks like at least heading in the right direction. Yeah, Alicia Huey, who is the NAHB chair, said that custom, uh, well, ultimately single family starts are expected to grow in 2024, adding much needed inventory to the market. They also went on to say that builders will face growing challenges with building material costs and availability as well as lot supply. You also have got a comment here from the chief economist that over at the National Association of Home Builders, Robert Dietz, saying that as home building expands in 2024, the market's going to see growing supply side challenges in the form of higher prices and or shortages of lumber lots and labor. So uh, those are a few of the broader themes to keep a close eye on here in the home builder sector. All right, well, retail sales out this morning. Once again, the consumer keeps spending, rising six tenths of a percent in December. Clothing and accessories posting a big gain during the month, seeing a 1.5 percent increase. Our next guest saying that the December numbers are not a complete washout, but are not particularly strong, especially on a historical basis. Let's talk about that with Jerry Storch. He's a former CEO of Toys R Us here to break all of this down. And Jerry, just your first reaction to the fact that one, consumers are still spending, but it sounds like you're not too excited by the numbers that we got out here this morning. Well, they're, they're, they certainly came out stronger than I thought they would when I wrote up my notes that you're you're referencing. Having said that, keep, uh, keep in mind inflation is still three to four percent, and so on a year-over-year -year basis, the retail sales, if you take out you know uh, restaurants and stuff, we're we're up about four 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 point eight percent. So still a good number, but not as high as it had in, you know past years. It's the weakest number I would say since about 2019. You know, we had huge numbers during the pandemic. There's some clear winners here. I mean, uh, automobile sales were up 10% year over year. That's that's remarkable. Electronics also up 10%. So maybe some good news for you know stocks like Best Buy and people like that. Uh, cosmetics continues to to to, to be uh, to be very strong. There's definitely a cosmetics uh, season as consumers are are strapped, and uh, e-com continues to roll. You know, the internet. Uh, weak categories were furniture, which are you know are highly uh, related to uh, to inter to interest rates. And also department stores continue to be negative year over year, uh, suggesting that they are in for a world of hurt as we go forward. Okay, so two of those things that we, we do want to break down here. We were just breaking down some of the, the home builder sentiment and, and confidence readings. How much of what we're anticipating in one category that you were mentioning in, in furniture and some of those home goods, how much of that is tied back to the housing market as well? A lot of it is the first thing you do when you buy a new house, right? Is you need to get the furniture for it. Uh, the other, another category that was down uh, is the, which, and has been down for quite some time on a, again on a year over year basis, is building materials. People like Home Depot and Lowe's, and so we're we've been waiting for that to try to turn around, but but it's not happening. And they posted you know spectacular numbers during the pandemic when people were stuck at home, had nothing to do but fix up their home, and now they've been negative for quite a while. Jerry, when you talk about who's best positioned within this race, a lot to focus on some of those discount retailers, especially when you compare it to the troubles that we've been seeing within department stores. Who, from your view, is best positioned at this point? And do you, do you see that trend at all changing as you look ahead to the next 12, 18, 24 months? 
look, eventually, as I said, these numbers were better than I thought they would, but eventually the consumer has to crack. They're under a lot of lot of pressure. Inflation continues. It may not be as high as it was in the midst of the pandemic, but it's still high by historical by historical standards. A lot of the spending that we're seeing based on other data is being fueled by by uh, consumers going into debt, both with with uh, credit cards and buy now, pay later. Types of uh, types of apps, and eventually that comes home to roost. So, so you have to feel things are continue to to slow as we go forward. The uh, you know most likely winners in that environment are are fairly obvious. It's you know Walmart who's done well, good times and bad, uh, and uh, Costco who just keeps doing it. You know they keep delivering, and I think that's because they really are a great value for for the consumer. And someone like TJX who undoubtedly has a lot of the uh, you know, apparel increases that you see in the numbers that came out today. So they've been doing very well as we come out of the recession. People need to need to dress up again. Jerry, what's what's the and I, I know that as your position, you know, as, as storage advisor CEO, but also former Toys R Us, uh, you, you have also, of course, former Hudson's Bay CEO and still hold board appointments at, I believe, Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as over at Fanatics. You've got a read and a, and a line of communication into many CEOs that are that are still out there right now. What what is their biggest concern or the, the red flag that they are watching and monitoring with this consumer right now? Look, I, I think most people feel like we're somewhat on borrowed time, and that uh, that uh, the uh, the numbers certainly have been have been better than mo than we all thought they should have been, you know. But there are there are some tough pockets out there, and uh, again, I highlight that department store number. It's not a good number. Uh, the luxury space I've heard is not doing very well, uh, which is also a sign of a stressed consumer uh, and particularly that that decline in, or that stress on luxury is coming from the what we call the aspirational luxury shopper they're the people who every once in a while buy a very expensive pair of sneakers or or expensive handbag and save up for it not the really wealthy people but the people you know just a little below that who who are who are are struggling uh, as we go forward here so i think what we're all going to watch here is to see whether or not uh the the inflation come down and incomes come come come, come up to the point where people are are doing better than they were doing, uh, you know, we've had year after year after year of this compounded inflation, and uh, and and products still look very expensive to consumers. I think people thought maybe inflation would reverse, right? You'd have deflation. You're hearing more and more talk about that, but you're not really seeing it yet, you know, in the in the numbers when you go shopping, and that's what we need to see for the consumer to be stronger. Hey, Jerry, let's talk about bankruptcies because we did see an uptick in 2023 for the year. It was up just about 18 percent, specifically though within the retail sector, given the fact that we are in the midst of a turnaround, given the fact that the consumer will likely continue to be under pressure here for 2024, what do you think the bankruptcy picture is going to look like? Well, I, the, the companies to watch are those that are highly leveraged. Retailers, you know, go bankrupt, that's for sure. But if you say who's going bankrupt, it's the ones that, that are highly leveraged. And they're either leveraged as a consequence of, uh, you know, of a private equity type uh, takeover of the company. In some cases, uh, companies have been sold more than once from one private equity company to another, or maybe some kind of uh, financing where they tried to generate additional cash through a variety of mechanisms. So if they're not if they're not uh, leveraged, retailers almost never go bankrupt, frankly, because the cash flows are so so desirable, and uh, you basically don't pay for your inventory until after you sell it, and the and everyone's okay with that kind of deal unless they get worried but whether you can pay your debt. So look for the highly leveraged retailers, and that's where you're going to find the ones with the risk of bankruptcy. And, I, and there are a number of them on everyone's watch list. Yeah, and a, a number of those have, have been in the department store category, as we were mentioning a moment ago. Jerry, great to have this conversation with you. Thanks so much for putting some additional context around these numbers. Storch Advisor CEO, as well as former Toys R Us CEO and Hudson's Bay CEO, Jerry Storch. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Certainly. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
December retail sales out this morning showing that U.S. consumer spending continued to prove resilient to round out 2023, but on the other hand, another economic powerhouse continues to struggle. China's economy slowed to a three-decade low in 2023. Brent Schutter, who is the Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer, is here to help us break it all down. How surprising, from your perspective, is a reading like this, Brent? Well, I think the retail sales number was strong, but as your prior guest mentioned, I think there are signs that the consumer is starting to, to feel a little bit of the higher interest rates. And I think the market is now figuring out that the U.S. economy is still too strong for the Fed to cut rates, that inflation is not dead. We saw that in last week's CPI numbers, where core CPI continues to come in below 3%, uh, as well as some of these trim mean measures that are trying to tease out the underlying pace of inflation. They've actually accelerated over the past few months. And so to me, the reason the market's struggling just a bit is because uh, the market which had priced in aggressive rate cuts, uh, and that led to the fourth quarter rally, are now starting to take those out, and that's causing a little bit of the higher interest rates and causing stocks to, to uh, push a little bit lower. And so kind of compare that for us, because here in the U.S. there's the resiliency, but then in China there's the effort to try and stimulate the economy and the, the spending. So if we're kind of comparing and contrasting what's take place, taking place and where there are perhaps some, some overlaps, because earlier in the trading session, we saw stocks moving lower, largely in reaction to that data that came out of China. And then you got the add-on with a surprise report in the U.S. retail sales figure as well. Yeah, look around the globe, the economy is slowing. You look at it in Europe, it's slowing. You look at it in China, it's slowing. Certainly the Chinese economy has been slowing for some time. They have a, a large set of issues they're dealing with. And so to me, it's not surprising that you're seeing economies around the globe slowing at similar times just because of the uh, impact of rate increase that has occurred. China's a little bit unique in its own right, where it has actually been trying to stimulate just a bit, but certainly not enough to pull their economy out of the doldrums that it has seen over the past few years. So, Brennan, in the market action today and what we heard from Waller yesterday, taking all that into account, we're starting to see maybe a bit of an adjustment in terms of the timing of that rate hike, like you just alluded to a minute ago. I'm curious how this has, has that at all impacted your view and your expectations for rate cuts and the timing of them? Look, we don't think the Fed's going to cut rates unless they see wages move sustainably lower. And so the reason why inflation pulled back last year was largely, uh, as we expected, because it was tied to COVID. What you are seeing now is that inflation is tied more towards the end of an economic cycle where we run out of workers to hire. You mentioned it in your NHB report where you said a shortage of labor, a shortage of lumber leading to higher prices. That is not disinflation. And so to me, the Fed does not cut rates until it sees the pace of wages slow and until it sees the inflationary uh, numbers come down much more, which they've actually stalled out at 3%. I think the last mile is still harder. Uh, and that's where I don't think the Fed cuts uh, until they see that happen. And, and that largely means that you're going to likely have a recession because they're going to keep the pressure on the U.S. economy from a rate perspective until they see the labor market weaken. And typically, once that happens, it tends to trend. So, Brendan, what does that mean for equities when you see this run up a lot of excitement about the Fed cutting some of that optimism already priced in? What does the downside then potentially look like? I think there's some downside in large cap stocks because they do trade at 20 and a half times uh, earnings that are expected to grow 7%. And they have pushed higher on the back in the belief that the Fed would be cutting uh, on the back of lower interest rates and lower inflation. And so I, I do think there's some downside risk there. I, I think even though inflation is set to probably uh, continue where it's at, I still think investors should be thinking about fixed income. Um, current rates are still around 5% on uh, investment grade fixed income, which I think does protect you against uh, some of the inflation that largely may come back. But ultimately, if you think about it, if we do get a recession, I think rates push lower and that's where bonds will prove uh, to be a, a real uh, return vehicle. So on the other side of that, Brent, is there a trade to fade in the events that we do see a cut or the probability for a cut continue to diminish on the likelihood that a, that cut may be pushed back or pushed out even further? Look, I, I just think you want to be careful here and you want to be cautious. I, you mentioned the other side of this. To me, the other side of this does have some good news. I mean, there are parts of the market that I've referenced before, and hopefully most of your guests are long-term investors. I think U.S. small caps, U.S. mid caps, those trade at 14 times earnings uh, that have already been marked down some and aren't expected to grow. Compare and contrast that to the large cap segment. I think the other side of this shows that small caps do very well, and I'd encourage uh, investors to add those as we go through the uh, what, what I think will be a, a, a couple tough months coming up in the not too distant future. All right, Brent Shitty, always great to uh, speak with you there and get your insight. Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer. Thanks, Brent. Thank you.
All right, let's take a look at two movers, and especially the moves that we're seeing in Spirit Airlines for a second day. Spirit Airlines and JetBlue under pressure this morning. You're looking at a loss of Spirit of about 23%. The stock selling off after a federal judge blocked JetBlue's $3.8 billion acquisition. The merger would have made JetBlue the fifth largest domestic airline. But the Department of Justice arguing that the deal would be unfair to travelers, that it would drive up costs, it would also reduce competition within the space. And taking it even a step further, the judge in this case saying that worse yet, the merger would likely incentivize JetBlue further to abandon its roots as a maverick low-cost carrier. So again, the fact, bringing it back to his initial point there, that this deal would not be beneficial to the consumer, that it would ultimately drive up prices. And Brad, from a shareholder standpoint, from an investor standpoint, even from a market standpoint, the question is, what happens now? Obviously, there had been interest from Frontier. Obviously, there's lots of questions, speculation about future m a activity even within the space given the fact that it is dominated by the four largest domestic carriers if any of these somewhat smaller carriers want to be able to compete they're going to have to bulk up in size but this decision here from the judge here obviously throwing a bit of cold water on that and some uncertainty uh, and you can see that reflected in the share prices here this morning yeah my mind immediately went to frontier yeah. we've had multiple conversations in the lead up to and ultimately on the other side the decision that shareholders made here and the uh, deal that will not consummate seems between JetBlue and Spirit. And so now Frontier and ULCC is one of the tickers that is also getting lit up on the Yahoo Finance platform. As of right now, it is down, last I checked, by about 4% here on the day. One of the things that Barry Biffle, the CEO of Frontier Airlines, had told us previously when the JetBlue and Spirit deal was seemed poised to go through, and ultimately uh, that was the way that we had been thinking as this was even under review, was that ultimately the really only losers are the consumers that are going to have to pay over 40% more with Spirit because, uh, but they can find over a million seats available at Frontier for $19 and higher. So now the competition for ultra low cost carriers is still uh, going to rage on, but it's just a larger question of for the, consu for the consumer experience, how many of them look at these options and say, okay, well, would I rather get nickel and dimed on even a low ticket and then charge for everything else? Or would I, would I prefer to look at an all in fee? Um, and I think that's kind of the toss up, especially in this consumer environment that we've been talking about over the course of this show right now. Well, everyone, we're going to continue to watch all of those tickers moving ahead from here, and we've got much more markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Brian Sazi right there next to me. We've been talking a lot about AI, of course, and one of the themes we've been exploring is whether AI is going to displace jobs. There's an interesting new survey out from KPMG. They talked to a thousand college educated uh, folks in the U.S. Um, I believe it was just U.S. And interestingly, around the concerns around AI, job displacement is not number one. Paul Knopp is with us now. He is head of KPMG. So it was not surprising. First of all, welcome. Thank I'm so excited to talk about this study, I guess. Yep. Um, that was a surprising result to me because it seems like jobs is such a point of discussion for people. It is. So, you know, the fact that 76% of millennials and Gen Z said that generative AI already impacts their professional lives in a big way and that they're not concerned about job displacement, what I think that really means is they understand the technology and they also know that it's the future and that it's actually mainstream at this point. So while a lot of companies are still running experiments and pilots, it really is getting to the point where we're nearing industrialization. And a lot of companies are already using it in certain applications of their business. What are big companies doing to upskill their workforce to drive these AI initiatives? Well, so they're putting tools in their hand, you know, tools like Microsoft Copilot, uh, ChatGPT, often, you know, like a company like KPMG, we put chat GPT advisory audit in a secure private environment to make sure that it can be trusted. And that really is what the game is, making sure you're bold, fast, and developing your generative AI solutions, but also making sure that you build trust around it. We call it a trusted AI framework or ethical framework. And that's gotten a lot of attention this week here at Davos. Paul, we always ask you about other companies, and we never seem to ask you about KPMG, <laughs> or the CEO of KPMG. Yeah. Are you hiring a good number of folks? How many people will you hire this year to support AI, advising companies on AI, or building out AI functions in your own company? Well, so last year, 2023, we hired about 7,800 people, our second highest number ever in terms of full-time hires and interns. This year, we're expected to be in, the, in a similar range. And if you think about it, everybody's going to be trained on AI at KPMG because we need all of our professionals to know that tool. So. We're really excited about that. Of course, we have some development experts, and we have those that train our people that are more specifically focused on generative AI. But it's really important that all of our people ideate around generative AI so we can bring interesting solutions to our clients, but also make work more interesting. Are there sort of accounting applications from generative AI, right? Uh, well, you, you, in accounting and auditing and tax, you think about there are principal standards, laws, regulations, they all exist in content. So it's perfect for generative AI because generative AI can mine that information and then you can much more quickly put together tax position papers, accounting position papers, determine how you might look at the risk of a certain business process. So it's is really it already doing that? Oh yes, so we, we can do that today. And so you, know, you can identify risk in a business process. You can, you can use chat, uh, a version of ChatGPT that's secure to help develop those kinds of uh, that kind of output, I have to I have to follow up on this because my brother's an accountant, so I, I have to send him this link. Yeah. So you're saying is AI is AI going to displace the accountant? So I go give my taxes to my brother at some point. Yeah. Maybe I just don't give it to him. Maybe I give it to a digital person. No, I would not say that it's going to replace the accountant. So I think it's going to re it's going to make more mundane routine activities automated, and upskill more people over time. So I think the reason that seventy 6% of millennials and Gen Z said that they find this to be really important to their professional lives is they find it incredibly interesting. It makes their work they do more valuable. I think over time, there'll actually be net job growth in the market because of generative AI. Um, and going back to the survey, you yeah. know, people weren't as worried about job displacement. They were somewhat worried, but what they were most worried about, fake news and information, which right. I thought was really interesting. Two thirds of folks worried about that. And scams, people, a similar number worried about that. So, you know, we see yeah. sort of anecdotal um, examples of that, right? So that's one point of discussion here. What yeah. needs to happen to prevent all of that from happening? So several things need to happen. One is that you need to start with an ethical AI framework. And two, you need to understand that trust is a precious commodity in business. It's the most precious commodity. And if you lose trust because of generative AI content that is not reliable, that hallucinates or it's just fake or misinformation, you're going to eventually lose business. Now, I, I understand that there are some uh, organizations in the world that might want to produce 
clickbait content for a certain purpose. And it's going to be incumbent upon companies, uh, governments, and other organizations to call that out and to pay strict attention to that. You've been here about uh, pretty much all week, Paul. Yeah. Has there been one or two tech companies or a piece of software or something AI-related that really I don't know, blew you away and, and got you thinking uh, of what could be possible? Well, I haven't seen, believe it or not, I haven't seen demonstrations of those products here this week because I've been mostly in meetings and in sessions, but I see them you know, all the time. And so, to me, it's just amazing that every generative, generative AI, large language model or image model or video model, is multiple times better than the model before it. So the rate at which it's evolving, the velocity of change is just phenomenal. And the, the amazing thing is that all those uh, models just get better with each generation. Um, what is demand looking like for you right now? Let, leaving AI yeah. aside for a moment, um, you know, it does seem like yeah. there is a relative amount of optimism about the U.S. Yeah. economy that we're hearing. How's that uh, informing your business? So we, we would agree with most economists and our economists thinks that it will be low growth this year, somewhere two and a half to three percent range. Demand for our services is still strong, audit and tax. It's a little bit softer in consulting. You know, we saw a lot a lot of companies start to get more cautious with spending in 2023, not just on consulting, but on many other things. You know, a lot of it was the uncertainty around the interest rate environment, the uncertainty around inflation and when it might cool. And that really caused companies to be a lot more cautious. And discretionary spending like that, it's kind of natural that you might see that hit. Now, there's a lot of reasons that companies are still consuming a lot of consulting, too. We still see our clients going through amazing business transformations, and they need to continue to transform to be competitive. Performance improvement is still huge. And then generative AI, companies trying to scale generative AI in a responsible, ethical way to their platforms to make sure that they retain a competitive advantage. We see a lot of that, and we think that that softening is actually going to subside later in the year. Are you getting clients, Paul, coming to you now saying, Paul, look, I, I'm concerned of another potential Trump presidency. How do I prepare my financial statements for another potential surprise? So we don't have clients that specifically ask that question, but you know they, they do worry about geopolitical events, and this week geopolitics has been a dominant theme here. And of course, there's quite a few elections across the world this year, including in the United States. I think what businesses are thinking, Brian, is that, you know, they're thinking about the fact that they've navigated administrations and split congresses and congresses that are dominate or that are controlled by either party over many years. And what they're trying to communicate to Washington and policymakers and legislators is that job growth for America is really important and for us to be delivering sustainable value over the long term we need to be able to work on really important things like tax, trade, immigration, education to make sure over the long term that we're building sustainable value for our enterprises. So I think we try to keep focused on that and knowing that historically speaking we'll be able to work with almost any administration. All right, we'll have to leave it there uh, for now. Paul Knopp, KPMG CEO, always great to get some time with you on the ground here yeah, at Davos. Here, here. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate Thanks. it. Appreciate All right, it. much more ahead from uh, Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum, including a special chat with Special Climate Envoy and former Secretary of State John Kerry. Big chat coming up.
Among the many big weighty issues, of course, that are being discussed at Davos, besides AI, are climate change and the fight to slow climate change. Of course, pivotal in that fight is Special Climate Envoy for the U.S., uh, John Kerry, and he is joining us now. Of course, Secretary Kerry, first of all, thank you so much Glad for be being here. Thank really you. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very much. Um, we have just gotten the news, of course, in the last couple of days that you're going to be stepping down from this particular role uh, sometime in the spring. So in your remaining few months, what's on the agenda? What do you really want to get accomplished, considering the, the clock is ticking on climate change? Well, the same thing is on the agenda that's been on the agenda from the beginning when President Biden created this role. And that is that the world is behind in this effort to deal with the climate crisis. And we're seeing the incredible costs to communities all around the world. And people are dying. Seven million people a year die just from the bad air quality that comes from greenhouse gases that are put up in the atmosphere. So in Dubai, just a few weeks ago, 195 nations agreed that we must transition away from fossil fuels and that we need to do so in according with the science, which means trying to keep 1.5 degree limit on warming and reaching net zero emissions by 2050 and accelerating right now. So mm -hmm. my job in these next uh, weeks uh, is to help in the transition, but to make certain that we are moving full speed and doing as much as we can to excite the business community to step up and help be leading this transition. We, we can't do this without major corporations around the world stepping up. And I'm glad to say that here in Davos, but previously in Dubai, we had uh, some of the, about 100 of the top corporations of the world, biggest companies in the world, step up and agree to help lead in this effort to transition. So we, we have a lot of work to do. It's exciting work. It's actually the biggest economic opportunity the world has known since the Industrial Revolution massive transformation of how we heat our homes, how we drive vehicles, or what kind of vehicles we drive, uh, you know, what, what fuels we use, uh, how we're going to have efficiencies built into our buildings and our homes, where we save money, and, and you actually have cheaper electricity. So the, there's really a plus side on the other side of this journey, and that's what we want people to understand. Yeah, with the CEOs, Julie and I have been able to talk with Mr. Secretary. They're focused on AI. They're focused on the outcome, whatever might be, with the election. When you talk to these CEOs, where does climate fall on that priority list? As a very high priority, but not necessarily the number one or two in many of their cases. I mean, a lot of these guys are fighting for market share. They're in steep competition with other countries. Uh, they're concerned about... Uh, uh, cost of capital, about inflation, about all those kinds of things, obviously. But they're also parents or grandparents, and they are deeply concerned about the future of this planet. And they know, because they've joined up with our efforts, that we need to reduce these emissions. There's only one cause of this climate crisis. It is the unmitigated, the burning of fossil fuel that does not capture the emissions. And so we have major initiatives now that people are engaging in to try to build out the technology to be able to capture, maybe do something with CO2, carbon dioxide. But we also have methane, which is being released from the earth by the permafrost thawing, which is happening because of the warming of the planet. And that methane is 80 to 100 times more destructive than CO2, and it's 20 times more destructive in the longer term. So look, if you can't, <laughs> if you're not uh, ready to acknowledge science and to, to, to recognize the reality of what is happening around the planet with greater intensity to storms, many more floods, torrential rainfall, greater intensity to tornadoes and winds with greater frequency, the damage that is being done by the climate crisis is now costing us already in the billions and it's going to cost much more if we don't move now. So I think these CEOs understand that. I mean, we have Apple and Microsoft and, and uh, uh, Google, uh, Salesforce, FedEx, Boeing, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, all these kinds of companies, CEOs, have made the decision that they're going to move into this low-carbon, no-carbon, clean economy. 
and that's the only way we avoid the worst consequences of the crisis. Secretary Kerry, all of these companies have made these pledges. Um, what about the other largest polluter in the world? Of course, China, your counterpart there is also stepping down. What's your level of confidence that momentum will continue with China and in cooperation with China on this issue? Well, I, I can't express that in terms of my confidence or lack of confidence. You know, we, we, we have to do all the things we promised to do, all of us. And we now have greater transparency and accountability in the system to know whether people are keeping their promises or not. We have satellite technology that now has the ability to track methane, track CO2, determine the footprint of any big corporation in the world. So people are not going to be able to hide inaction or, or, or not enough action. We will have accountability. Now, China has brought a massive amount of coal plants online. And, and frankly, it's been one of the areas of discussion between us. Uh, but China is, uh, is also manufacturing and deploying more renewables than all the rest of the world put together. So we have to see how this unfolds. We agreed to work with China in a transparent, constructive way, accountable. Uh, we're not giving up anything in doing that. Uh, but it's a way for us to make certain that we are all in this together because no one country can solve this problem alone. We have to all be at the table and doing it. And that includes China, which is the largest emitter in the world. We're the second largest emitter. We're the largest economy. They're the second largest economy. So that's why China and the United States have been sitting down to try to figure out where are the areas we may be able to cooperate together in the interests of the whole planet and of citizens everywhere? Four years into the presidency of, of Joe Biden, what is the, the state of our relationship with China? Obviously, there are very real issues between us, which we have fundamental differences on. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and President Biden and President Xi sat down recently in meetings in uh, California and San Francisco. I was privileged to be part of the large discussion that we had. And, um, and, and the, both leaders were very clear about the interests that they are duty bound to protect. And we needed to understand from President Xi and they needed to understand from President Biden. Uh, I think President Biden made it crystal clear where the differences are that we need to work on. Uh, and there are big issues, access to the marketplace, theft of intellectual property, the questions of what's going to happen to nuclear weapons, uh, uh, both with China as well as with Kim Jong-un in North Korea, Hong, uh, Hong Kong, uh, uh, Taiwan. I mean, there are a lot of these issues. But President Biden and President Xi decided early on in President Biden's in, in administration that we were going to work to try to keep the climate issue separate because it's not a bilateral issue. It's a multilateral, global issue where all of us are involved and every one of us needs the rest of the big polluters, big, uh, big uh, emitters in the world to come to the table and be part of the solution. President Biden has been leading in that effort, holding a summit, two or what, three virtual summits now in the last three years, in which he has brought the largest emitters in the world to the table and raised the ambition of each and every one of those countries to be able to address this issue faster. So uh, I think his leadership has been critical. The passage of the IRA in the United States is creating an amazing amount of jobs at home. It's, it's the strongest uh, environmental legislation in the world. There are other countries that wish they had it. Uh, and the result of it is that we're creating jobs on new technologies, uh, which is going to lower the cost of energy for Americans. Example, solar has come down 83 percent in price, distinctively cheaper than fossil fuel energy. And in fact, last year, solar alone had a greater amount of investment than fossil fuels did. So we're seeing the transformation really beginning to take hold now. And uh, my sense is that uh, China and the United States need to work together in order to make sure we meet our goals. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, one of the reasons you're reportedly stepping down is so that you can help campaign to reelect Joe Biden as president. W what do you see as your role? What specifically will you be doing for him? Well, I'm, I, uh, 
as a federal employee, I live under something called the Hatch Act, where you're not supposed to engage in politics, in elected politics, partisan politics. And so um, what I will really do is regain my own voice uh, by not being a federal employee. Uh, and, uh, and I will campaign for President Biden because I think the stakes are so high, not just in our country and for our country, but for the world. And, and I, I'm not going to go into the why of that and describe it now uh, while I'm in my transition, but at some point uh, I'll make very clear what I think is at stake in the race and uh, why, I'm, why I want to be engaged in that discussion. Sir, thank you very much for your time. Great I appreciate to be with it. You. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you. Chinese EV maker BYD unveiling its new AI vehicle. The EV maker announced its new AI-powered system at its Dream Day event as part of its $14 billion bet on smart cars here. What they had to announce as part of this was the Xuanji architecture, integrating electrification with intelligence is what they were discussing at this particular event. And ultimately, the chairman and president of BYD saying that integrated vehicle intelligence is set to steer the future of vehicular uh, direction of vehicular intelligence, accelerating transma uh, transformation of the automotive industry. Yeah, it racks up a lot of interest as of right now, but it still comes with the larger question mark of how many people will be deploying full self-driving or autonomous and intelligence, um, are artificial intelligence related driving in the near future as it relates to different regions that this will be operating in as well. Yeah, 
and this also just speaks to the fact that car companies around the world need to continue to invest in technology in yep. that next uh, generation in order to keep up with rivals. We know that the competition within China, obviously, on a global scale, has really been intensified. We take a look at a number of BYD rivals. They have been investing in new EV models, in more technology. Xpeng, Neo, Zeker, among those names that have been revealing new EV models uh, as of late. So. This announcement here from BYD showing that they are continuing to invest within this space or doing everything they can to separate their car, their offering from what else is on the market there. Just to put that priority in perspective, the company holding its Dream Day event this week where their chairman saying that at BYD, more than 90,000 employees, 90,000 employees work in the research and development departments alone, 4,000 of them working on smart driving. So that clearly just shows where the priorities lie within BYD, where the vision is for this company and what they plan to do in order to capitalize on some of that momentum. We certainly have seen that reflected in the sales numbers with BYD overtaking Tesla in terms of uh, numbers of cars sold. So what that's going to take in order to continue uh, that momentum going forward, a lot of that resting on some of their investments in yeah. the smart car, some of their investments in technology and really differentiating their product from what else is on the market. It impacts everything from how drivers engage with the vehicle to the realities of the roads that we're operating these vehicles on. And yeah, the insurance that you're paying for these cars too, if you've got that much data that's also being ingested and able to give a better sense of what type of person is behind the wheel and the safety uh, that is then added onto as well here. So uh, a lot of different facets of this story. We're gonna continue to watch it here and how that's integrated into the mobility experience. We also have much more market moving stories in our 11 o'clock program. We've got Dave Nidig, who is the Betify Financial Futures, joining us at 4R ETF report, brought to you by Invesco QQQ. We're break down the winners and losers of Bitcoin ETFs after three days of trading. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau unveiling its long-awaited changes to overdraft fees at America's biggest banks. We will dig into the two proposals and how they might impact your wallet. That's coming in the next hour. And of course, much, much more from the Slopes, the Swift Salps, and our team that's over at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Julie Hyman, Brian Sazi speaking with Robert Smith, Vista Equity Partners founder, chairman, and CEO, and Anthony Scaramucci, Skybridge founding, uh, founder and managing partner as well. We've got much more. We do. Well, that's all for us today. But Akiko Vegeta, Rochelle Kuva, they've got you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita alongside Rochelle Akufo. Here's what we're watching at this hour. December retail sales out this morning show that U.S. consumer spending continued to prove resilient to round out 2023. Stocks pulling back, though. We're going to break down the latest market action this hour. That's right. And we'll check in on spot Bitcoin ETFs a week into trading. Who are the winners and losers? And what's the best strategy for your portfolio? We'll discuss. Plus, we're going to head back out to the World Economic Forum in Davos, where Julie Hyman and Brian Sazi will bring us some key interviews this hour with Vista Equity Partners founder Robert Smith and Skybridge founder Anthony Scaramucci. That's right. But first, let's take a look at how markets are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Still looking at some selling action here, although it has slowed down a little bit. Looking at the Dow, though, still off about 20 points, relatively flat. The S&P 500 there down about 30 points, about 0.6%. We're seeing the tech, tech um, names really dragging here. The MagServe not magnificent at all today, which explains why we're also seeing the Nasdaq down just over 1% or down about 159 points. You have investors really mulling a lot of this day to the consumer determined to spend in December, earnings and of course cautious Fed speak on those rate cut expectations. So let's also take a look at the Treasury market as we look at that. Also seeing some bond yields being pushed up, especially at the shorter end. The five year currently up more than 2% on the day, sitting at 4.03. The 10 year seeing that big boost. They're also up but sitting at 4, 4.11 there, up 1% on the day. And the longest term 30 year yield also up about half a percent on the day. Well, as Rochelle mentioned, stocks coming off of their lows of the session following disappointing economic data out of China, as well as higher than expected U.S. retail sales. Our very own Inez Ferre is at the Interactive with the latest sector moves. Inez. Yeah, Kiko, and just taking a look at the sectors right now, we are seeing real estate, technology, consumer discretionary. These are the big laggards for today. You've got healthcare and staples that are barely eking out some gains. But just pulling up the NASDAQ 100, because Rochelle had mentioned the NASDAQ out of the major averages is the one that it's losing the most right now. And we're looking at Tesla that's down more than 2%. NVIDIA, which yesterday was up about 3% today, giving back some of those gains. You've got Apple that's slower as well. Then just taking a look at the Dow, we are seeing a little bit of a mixed picture right now. As I mentioned, healthcare is in the green. So you've got United uh, Healthcare that's in the green right now. You also have JP Morgan, uh, some of the banks that are eking out some gains. You also had mentioned the China data that was coming out about their GDP. Well, take a look at the Chinese stocks right now. Heavily under pressure. You're looking at JD that's down more than 5%, around 5%. Alibaba is lower. But if we just take a look at a year-to-date chart, even more pressure that we were seeing. Baba down 12% year-to-date, guys. And Inez, of course, one of the biggest losers this week for markets has been natural gas. So what's happening there? Yeah, let me pull up the natural gas uh, chart for you right there. Uh, because we have seen the natural gas prices had seen a rally up till now. But then over the last week, we have seen some selling. Part of this has to do with temperatures that are lower than expect or that, that are a little bit higher than expected, meaning that there was expected to be an even bigger cold front. And when you have uh, high lower temperatures and you are going to be using more natural gas. But I'm going to be showing you a two-month chart here so you can see this rally uh, that we saw here, a little bit of an overextension here. Now we're seeing a little bit of selling off that's going on. But I'm going to pull up a two-year chart so you can see where natural gas prices have been because they've been very volatile over the last couple of years. But look, there is plenty of supply of natural gas, and natural gas is sort of a byproduct when you drill for oil. So the U.S. has been drilling quite a bit, and so therefore you all you also have a lot of natural gas supply. It's all supply and demand. And when you when it comes to natural gas, there's plenty of it. So the range is expected to be around the three dollar range going forward, guys. Great context there, especially you look at that drop 33 percent over the last two years. Great stuff to watch. Appreciate you as always. Our very own Inez Ferre. Well, stocks are under pressure and Treasury yields climbing as investors begin to succumb to the reality that Fed rate cuts may not come as early or as aggressive as they'd hoped. U.S. retail sales this morning showing that the consumer remained strong to end 2023 despite slowdown concerns. We have Anthony Saccaro, Providence Financial and Insurance Services president, here to break all of this down. So, Anthony, how much of this is about the disconnect between Fed speak and market expectations versus just sort of a lot of people who sort of took those profits at the end of the year and just sort of clung on to the rally. 
Well, the Federal Reserve has always said that it's going to be data dependent and they're going to make the changes along the way, depending on what the data says. And when Waller spoke yesterday, uh, he basically you know, focused on the one thing that really has declined over time, which is GDP. That's come down. With everything else, when you talk about the labor market, when you talk about the strength of the consumer, when you talk about inflation spending, those were items that he talked about and then gave reasons why he thinks that they're going to slow down. He talked about the labor market and the fact that it's still strong, but the the, the number of jobs for employees coming down, so they expect that to weaken and to become more imbalanced. Consumer spending still up, right? December retail sales up 0.6%. But consumer savings are going down, credit card rates are going up, so they expect that that's going to go down over time. Inflation, you know, is is still higher than they want it to be on the PCE and both the CPI when you look at the year over year. But if you look at the last three months and six months, that's within a stone's throw distance of where they want it to be. So Waller did a compelling job of saying, hey, everything right now is in a great situation, but it's getting weaker. It's coming down the metrics that we look at, and therefore we think that there are still going to be rate cut. The challenge is, are they going to be as aggressive as the market is pricing in? And the Treasury yields are telling us that that's probably not going to happen. 60% chance in March that they cut the first time. I think it's what's being priced in. I have doubts about that. Uh, Anthony, you know, there is still the question about how much of that monetary policy is actually taken hold, right? I mean, that'll sort of determine the trajectory of the economy this year. Uh, we had some comments coming through from the IMF over in Davos yesterday saying 75% of the Fed's policy is now reflected in the U.S. economy. I, I wonder how you read that as you think about your investment case. How much further of a slowdown is there ahead? Yeah, so, you know, Waller basically said yesterday that monetary policy is still tight, and that is very true. It is still tight. It's hard to quantify. Is it 75%, is it 50%, or is it 100% baked in? Um, right now, the numbers are going in the direction that we want. Uh, the CPI is coming down, the PCE is coming down, the labor market rate, if you look back at that a year ago, I think the ratio, there were uh, two jobs available for every worker. And now there's only one and a half jobs available. I think it's 1.4 jobs to be specific for every worker that's available. That number's come down. Uh, you know, so the fact is that it's going in the right direction. And right now, the Federal Reserve has no reason to move at all. When March comes, if the data is still as strong as it is now, there's no reason for them to lower rates. There's going to have to be something that happens. Something's going to have to give in order for them to make it a decision one way or the other. And Nancy, some of the risks that we heard coming out of Davos, Jamie Dimon citing his concerns about U.S. debt, about geopolitical risks, as well as some of the financial risks that he thinks markets have gotten complacent about. David Solomon also voicing that, especially when you think of still ongoing conflicts, two years in Ukraine, Israel, of course, and then what we're seeing in the Red Sea. At what point do we get a better vision and an understanding of how the risks are being priced in and how can people position themselves? Yeah, those are all great questions. I'm not even sure that they're necessarily answerable as far as when do we get a better understanding. I think we'll get a better understanding when something happens, right? Uh, we just don't know. That's the thing is with the geopolitical events, especially, I think that's the number one fear that I have is that something could happen. We can't put a terrorist attack on U.S. soil out of the realm of possibility. We've had it before. It's something that could happen again. We've got two wars going on at least. Uh, and then intellectual wars going on elsewhere geopolitically. I think that's the biggest risk. Um, the, the challenge is, is how do you navigate that risk? And what we're doing with our clients, and, and keep in mind, I worked in the fixed income space with people who are retired. What I'm focused on is investments that pay income because the interest and dividends are something you can count on. And at this point in time, fixed income could be used as a capital appreciation play. That's something that hasn't happened or been available in over four decades. So I think whether you're retired and need the income, the high yield, it's a great time to lock in high yield, or if you're growing up and headed towards retirement, buying some fixed income for capital appreciation and locking in a high yield at the same time, I think all that makes sense. Certainly still a lot to digest a few weeks into the new year. Anthony Sicaro, Providence Financial and Insurance Services President. Good to talk to you today. Thank you for having me. Well, we are hearing from a number of members of the Federal Reserve this morning. Not necessarily about monetary policy, though. Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr speaking today about cyber risk, while Fed Governor Michelle Bowman gave a uh, speech pushing back against Basel III. Let's hone in on some of those proposed capital requirements or comments around that. We've got Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger uh, with the details. Jen.
Good morning, Akiko. Two Fed governors pushing back against the Fed's proposed capital requirements, arguing for major changes, adding pressure to these already controversial provisions. In a major speech this morning, Fed Governor Michelle Bowman argued that increasing capital requirements at the scale proposed could significantly harm the U.S. economy and argued for major changes. She also took issue with removing tailoring capital requirements to banks' size and risk profile, arguing she hasn't seen compelling evidence that removing tailoring bolsters the banking system. Bowman saying, quote, in a speech before the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, higher levels of capital enhance financial resilience up to a point, but capital is not costless. Relying simply on the more is better approach downplays or ignores critically important trade-offs. Bowman's comments come just after her fellow uh, Fed governor, Christopher Waller, made comments on Tuesday saying that he thinks the blowback against the proposed rule seen from both the banking industry and on Capitol Hill has shown it's not necessarily a good proposal as it stands right now. Waller said, quote, it's got to have a major overhaul, in my view, to get a reasonable product and, you know, possibly even just taking it back and starting over. Last July, the Fed proposed increasing bank capital requirements by 16 percent for banks with 100 billion in assets or greater, also raising capital for risk weighted assets by 20 percent. Uh, those comments for those proposals were due yesterday. The banks vehemently oppose this proposal, arguing it would harm consumers and the economy. Bowman, for her part, says she's, quote, cautiously optimistic that officials can rally around a compromise. Guys. All right. Appreciate that update. Our very own Jennifer Schoenberger. Thank you so much. All right, now let's get you a look at some of our trending tickers. Shares of EV makers down broadly today, with Rivian taking the biggest hit. The auto company was downgraded at Deutsche Bank, with the analysts citing downside risk to 2024 expectations around the company's volume and gross margins, writing in, note, writing in a note to clients that they expect 2024 volume guidance of just 65,000 units amid prolonged factory shutdowns and slow ramp-up. And Akiko, this seems to be... A consistent problem when it comes to Rivian, you keep waiting for that next catalyst where they'll really get production and volumes up. It just doesn't seem to be happening here, which is how they ended up on this list. Um, how fair do you think this is? Though? Do you, what are you seeing in terms of the commentary around Rivian? Yeah, you know, I mean, what we're hearing from analysts at Deutsche Bank, pretty much what we've been watching in the EV space as a whole. We have seen softening demand. There are concerns about this transition that's happening to all electric. Is it going to slow down because of the lack of infrastructure and, quite frankly, because of the lack of affordability? When you think about Rivian specifically, there are two considered to be another catalyst moving forward. Some have called it that potential Model 3 moment for Rivian, but that's still to be determined here. So it in many ways, this downgrade from Deutsche Bank, not necessarily a surprise. I mean, you have to wonder how much of that, uh, Rochelle, is a Rivian-specific story, which you could argue part of it is, but also how much of that is a broad EV story. And on that note, another stock that we're watching today, Tesla, trending on Yahoo Finance is global demand. Competition forces the EV giant to slash prices once again. Tesla trimming prices for its Model Y across several countries in Europe a week after announcing similar price cuts for its Model 3 and Model Y cars in China. Rochelle, we're talking specifically about four countries in Europe, including Germany as well as France, price cuts anywhere from roughly 4% to 8%. I mean, this is sort of the reality that Tesla is now dealing with. Again, not just Tesla, all EV makers as a whole, but these price cuts are increasingly getting really aggressive. The question is, as we've been speaking to so many analysts, you know, is this about volume for Tesla? And does that make up for the lack of pricing power that they now have in a very, very competitive environment? It's true. I mean, and it is, especially when you think of how they're competing in China, a very competitive environment there. So when you look at some of the cuts they had to make, so for the long range uh, Model Y and the performance reduced by 9% and 8.1% the prices there. And then, of course, when you think of, of some of these other car companies, UBS removing BYD from their China focus list, because they also were cutting prices in Q4 as well of last year. So you have this sort of race to the bottom here, but they obviously test the more flexible 
and some of these other companies, your traditional EV makers in this country, they're able to do that with pricing. But we keep seeing that, that focus on what that's doing to margins. I mean, obviously, a lot of Tesla bulls still think that Tesla can manage it, but it's it speaks to that broader picture, yeah. as you mentioned there. Is it so much of a demand picture versus Tesla having some of its own internal issues with the fundamental business as well? Well, and Rochelle, you know, it feels like we're talking about Tesla every day, but Tesla's been hit with a lot of negative headlines over the last few months. I mean, most recently, we had that massive recall for Tesla cars. There's questions about the reliability and safety of the car at a time when there are more options for consumers out there. And of course, yesterday we were talking about Elon Musk trying to get more control within Tesla, but that's more of his focus on AI and robotics. It really does speak to some of the dynamics within these companies. So, of course, we have to talk NEO, another one cutting prices. The Chinese EV maker announcing that it will offer discounts on current models as it begins to roll out the 2024 vehicles. NEO also feeling the pressure as China's GDP comes up short. Now, this was tough because China's GDP grew 5.2% in the fourth quarter compared to a quarter a year ago. And that came from the National Bureau of Statistics. But that came in below expectations. We keep waiting for this recovery, especially as China's economy has a dual mandate that includes getting a lot more consumer demand there and not seeing it. This sluggish demand, it really does trickle into other companies. As we mentioned with Tesla, one of the most exposed companies to China other than Apple. So when you see this slow growth, growth that they hadn't seen as slow since, I believe, 1976, apart from the COVID years, this really does spark concerns about whether or not these companies can bounce back, Akiko. Yeah, more of a macro econ story there, particularly around EV market in China. Um, you could argue the infrastructure story is a little better there, but you're certainly right. There are concerns about just the pricing power or just how would the appetite consumers have um, for spending on some of these cars. Story we're going to continue to follow. I have a feeling we're going to be talking about EVs and Tesla again tomorrow, Rochelle. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, we'll have to put a pin in that for now, but stay with us this hour as our Davos coverage is, is continuing. Skybridge founder and managing partner Anthony Scaramucci joins us to talk all things crypto and the possibility of a Trump presidency in 2024. Stay with us. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is proposing a new rule, one that would sharply limit overdraft charges at big banks and credit unions. Now, the rule could save households up to $3.5 billion a year in fees. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith to discuss what it might mean 
for the banks. And we know that this is something President Biden has been trying to push for, trying to cut some of these fees here. Yeah, Rochelle, I mean, over the past six months, uh, big banks have mainly been sweating uh, these regulations that have come from the Fed uh, back in July. That's called uh, Basel Endgame. Um, and regulators have been trying to push that proposal uh, through. The ball is now in their court. And it's, it's expected to dampen earnings um, for the future for these banks. This new rule you're talking about on overdraft fees um, could act as a similar damper on earnings. Banks have relied on overdraft fees as one piece of their income stream for a long time. Um, and that's sort of been under threat for a while, but it does still remain to be see with the, seen with this rule how much these overdraft fees do get capped or if the rule gets approved. Uh, some big banks also in recent years have actually sharply slashed their, their overdraft fees like Citigroup and Bank of America. So we'll be watching to see how this rule plays out and whether or not it becomes a serious thing there the big banks begin talking about. Yeah, David, you, you mentioned the potential impact to bank earnings there from these proposed rules. Um, do we have any idea how significantly it could weigh on them? Um, not as much. Not as much now. I, you know, mainly what's going on is that banks are trying to focus on uh, the Basel rules. Uh, those are also pretty difficult to predict how they would impact capital. But what banks are largely doing is they're setting aside. Uh, the maximum amount they would need. Now, again, the, the ball is still in the Fed's court, so they're waiting to see uh, whether or not uh, those rules come in as proposed or if they're not changed further. Okay, David Hollerith staying on top of that for us. Thanks so much. Well, coming up, we're going to break down the winners and losers in the spot Bitcoin ETF space. One week later, stick with us. It's January and it's cold in New York City. So the Yahoo Finance team is packing up its skis and investing knowledge and heading to the Swiss slopes for the World Economic Forum in Davos. I know what you're thinking, folks. It's colder there in Switzerland, but myself, Julie Hyman, and the Yahoo Finance live team plan to heat things up with some big time interviews with the who's who of global business. The so-called masters of the universe will convene around the theme of rebuilding trust. There's no trust issues here, you can rely on us to ask the most important questions to the world's most high-profile leaders. Is the world more divided than it has ever been before? Is AI really bigger than the internet? Is this year's huge election cycle the risk we've all been missing? Will the bull market in stocks end really badly? You won't miss anything with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Yahoo Finance Live and the Yahoo Finance platform. From top leaders in the banking, pharma, and crypto sectors to access the world's foremost academics and some policymakers for good measure. We've got you covered. Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos starts on Tuesday, January 16th. You don't want to miss it. Time for our chart of the day. Investors are pulling back from grayscale spot Bitcoin ETF. The fund has seen outflows of about 579 million in the first five days of trading. That's according to data from Bloomberg. The other nine spot Bitcoin ETFs, on the other hand, have raked in around $1.4 billion. Well, this is trading day number four for Bitcoin ETFs. A number of ETFs from ARK, Grayscale, and iShares trading lower today. Over the last three days, we've seen about $803 million in net outflows or net flows into these products. That includes over $1 billion in outflows from Grayscale's more costly ETF, ticker GBTC. That's all according to Vetify. For more, let's bring in Dave Nadig, Vetify Financial Futurist, for our ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Uh, David, feels like it, these Bitcoin ETFs have been trading for much longer, given how much we've talked about it. Um, give me a sense of, of your view on where the inflows and outflows have been roughly one week into this. It's, you know, it's about what we predicted. We all expected there to be significant outflows from GBTC. It's the most expensive by far at one and a half percent. 
Uh, and so we expected some of that money to flow out, but not all of it. You know, the 20 some odd billion that's still sitting there. Some of that's trapped with capital gains. Some of it's perfectly happy to be with Grayscale and has been with Grayscale for a long time. And a lot of that money inevitably has flowed into some of these new competitors. The three on screen, IBIT, FBTC and BITB from Bitwise. They've been the big recipients of that net flow from GBTC sellers into these new spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, you know, overall, about a billion coming into the complex is about what we sort of predicted for a first week flow. Uh, what's really surprised us has been the volumes. We've had $10 billion trade hands in these products already in just three trading days. That puts these funds already at the top of the leaderboard as some of the most liquid ETFs in the market. It just goes to show you, if you give people what they want, they're going to trade it. So Dave, with that in mind, if you're a buy and hold investor versus someone who's a more active trader, how should you be stacking these up against each other so that you can pick out the right mix for your portfolio? If you're looking long term to make an allocation, and I hear this from advisors all the time, you know, I want to put in a two, three, four percent allocation, part of my, you know, liquid alts or my real assets portfolio. Um, the Bitwise product, BITB, it's the lowest long term price in the market right now at 20 basis points. Bitwise has spent a lot of time courting institutional and advisor investors. Uh, those are folks that are really making those big long term decisions. Uh, they've done some of the biggest and best work on all of the issues the SEC has. So along with Grayscale, I give Bitwise a lot of credit for getting us over the starting line. And that, I think, is going to be where you see the long-term advisor money flow. The shorter-term trading money, I suspect, is going to be either in GBTC, where it's been for a while, or in that iShares product, iBit. iBit's volumes have been phenomenal, and I suspect those will be the first options we see trading as well. And Dave, there's certainly a lot of investors out there that are just dipping their toes into this space through ETFs. When you consider equities ETF versus Bitcoin, what's the exposure you are telling clients they should have? Well, so again, if you're going to play in spot Bitcoin, the ETF is a phenomenal way to do it. It's actually right now, a lot of these funds have no expense ratios whatsoever. So it's just unquestionably the cheapest way to get Bitcoin exposure, cheaper than going on chain and buying it the old fashioned way, you know, in the crypto ecosystem. Uh, if you're thinking about crypto equities, you have to recognize this is a little bit like thinking about gold miners versus gold itself correlated, but not 100% connected. Uh, I think most folks are probably looking to go into Bitcoin itself. I would actually expect to see some money of this in those miners ETFs flow out into some of these spot ETFs, money that's been in the ETF ecosystem that's really wanted to play ball in crypto. So I, I think that's really what we're going to start seeing. So Dave, we know a lot of this institutional interest got investors in. What is going to keep them in? Because they keep waiting for this, this rush as you look at some, some of the numbers that get thrown out there about how high this could go. But give us a reality check here. Well, you know, there are there are a lot of things that are positive for Bitcoin's prices. Obviously, the launch of the ETFs opens up a huge demand market, right? Folks can now get a little bit of Bitcoin exposure in their 401k brokerage window, for instance. Uh, so that's a net positive on demand. And on the supply side in April, we do have the halving, right? The the way that crypto is, crypto is mined will change, the way Bitcoin is mined will change. Uh, that will make far less Bitcoin come onto the market. So that combination of increased demand and decreased supply, you know, macroeconomics 101 should suggest those prices should go up. But I do think it's important to point out that if you're playing with Bitcoin in the ETF ecosystem, you're not really participating in crypto. It's not quite the same as having stable coins and staking assets on Ethereum. There's a whole ecosystem there that's still vibrant and where incredible innovation is happening. The Bitcoin ETFs are going to kind of be on the side and may ride that price difference, uh, but they're not really participating in that ecosystem. And something interesting that you bring up in your notes, the options ecosystem, you say it's yet to emerge. Break that down as to what that will look like and how people should look at investing there. Sure. So probably the, the biggest sort of traditional options trading in the crypto space right now are on BITO, the ProShares futures-based Bitcoin fund. Um, that had options launch on, in 2021 within a few days of it trading uh, because of its structure. These spot ETFs are a little bit different. They're going to have to go through what's called a 19B4 process. The exchanges have to file new paperwork to allow them to have options written against them. I suspect that will take something on the order of a month. Uh, and once that opens up, I think we'll see volumes really explode. Once people start 
trading uh, zero data expiration options on Bitcoin, I suspect you're going to see this whole ecosystem expand significantly. Doesn't necessarily mean that all of the prices go up, right? Because one of the things you can do is buy puts. Uh, you can get some protection on your Bitcoin exposure. I suspect we're going to see a rash of products that marry those two things together, generating income from your Bitcoin exposure, buffering your downside of your Bitcoin exposure. All of those things we've seen in traditional equities over the last couple of years, huge money gatherers, particularly in the equity space. We'll see it in Bitcoin within a few months. Well, you know, we'll be tracking all of those catalysts. Hopefully we have you back to see how they all pan out. Dave Nadig there, there to find financial futurists. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Well, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is reportedly unable to fly home today as planned from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. That's due to an error with the Boeing 737 aircraft. After boarding the aircraft, Blinken and others were informed the plane was deemed unsafe to fly due to an unresolved oxygen leak. And of course, the Kiko, just an, a really another blow for Boeing. It's been a pretty tough week, as we saw with already the, the issue that they had with the plug door. So continuing to see some issues here. And you think when you're coming out of Davos, already a lot of concerns over climate change, a lot of eyes on this story as well. Certainly not the impression that you want to leave with. Yeah, it's not a good headline for Boeing, but, you know, I would sort of caution that we don't really necessarily want to conflate everything, right, in terms of what's playing out with Boeing. Uh, Bloomberg reporting that there is now a, a smaller jet that is being flown to Zurich from Brussels so that Anthony Blinken can get home. Uh, the rest of his staff reportedly having to take commercial back to D.C., which... Rochelle would not be the worst thing, I would argue. Uh, certainly, it's been a busy time, though, we should mention, for the Secretary of State, uh, given just uh, all the conflicts he's had to deal with. Um, just coming on the back of uh, a speech he gave or a talk he gave over at Davos, talking specifically about the need for a pathway to a Palestinian state. So, trip taking a little longer than expected, uh, but, uh, of course... We hope for a safe return back to D.C. Well, we are heading back across the Atlantic for an interview with Vista Equity Partners founder Robert Smith from Davos, Switzerland. That's coming up on the other side. We'll be right back. Well, DEI initiatives have been under attack in some quarters in the United States. Of course, they are part of the conversation here at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And one of the folks who is definitely putting forth, pushing forward that conversation is Robert Smith. He's Vista Equity Partners, founder, chairman, and CEO. That firm just around $100 billion in assets under management. And it's always a pleasure 
to talk to him, to have the opportunity. Robert, well, I was happy to be here welcome. with you. Welcome. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. being here. Yeah, my so, pleasure. as I mentioned, DEI has gotten quite controversial in the United States. Um, what do you make of that, and how? How do you kind of manage around that and stay the course? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Julie. I'm, I'm not quite sure why it is so controversial. You know, the, the facts are irrefutable, uh, that more diversity in thought and opinion and teams actually produce better outcomes, lower risk, higher returns, faster growth, and, you know, McKinsey, BCG, you name the consultant has come up with this. In our space in uh, asset management, you know, we, NAIC has put together a 20-year longitudinal study, they've done it twice, and shows that, you know, diverse firms have been performing 200 to 1,600 basis points over the Burgess a uh, average uh, for over 25 years. So, you just wonder why it's so controversial in, in, in some respects, and I can't explain, you know, exactly why it is, but I will tell you that the, the proof of the pudding uh, is that these companies have performed better. And when you have diverse boards, when you have diverse companies, you know, that, that diversity of insight actually has accelerated uh, growth. So it's, while some are coming forward with rhetoric uh, about, oh, it's not the right answer, what we are saying, I'm saying with executive CEOs that I know in the U.S. and here, are they actually follow the data and say, listen, while we may not talk about it as much, we are going to absolutely do the things that make sense as fiduciaries of capital and of stewards of, of uh, stakeholder interest to ensure we get the highest returns and the lowest risk profile and diversity shows that and having more diversity and, and inclusion is one of the best ways to, to accomplish that at scale sustainably over time. Are, are you finding that you are having fruitful conversations here in Davos? You know, how are you sort of bringing that to Davos yeah. um, and, and moving it that forward. You know, it, it is so wonderful uh, that you asked that question because people say, why do you go to Davos? And this is one of the, one of the reasons. And I was just uh, reminded, um, one of my good friends, Chuck Robbins at Cisco, and he and I, you know, have do a bunch of things together in Glance, but it was here. Uh, that we decided to do something about the broadband disparity for the HBCUs. And in that effort, uh, one of the elements we found, the Department of Education had basically put out a, uh, a, a in essence, an edict that if you don't have the proper cybersecurity uh, infrastructure and protection, you lose Title IV funding. Well, the HBCUs, about 80% of the students need that in order to matriculate. And uh, Chuck and I sat in one of the buildings and said, you know, let's do something about it. Uh, Cisco came in with capital. We came in with resources, capital uh, and, and resources. And we have now uh, completed 61 of uh, the companies or the, the HBCUs that actually had deficiencies in that area, which protected one and a half billion dollars a year uh, in Title IV funding. Now that's kind of phase one. Phase two, of course, is how do we br bring infrastructure for broadband access for the 82% of the HBCUs that are in these broadband deserts. Mm -hmm. And it's the partnerships that I've created here and the relationships that I've created here that translate back as part of the Edison Alliance and others uh, with you know, Verizon and others that has enabled us to now put together over 45 different town halls, over 5,000 you know, people in the U.S. across the southern states uh, so that we now have the ability to deliver uh, the data, the information, so they, then I, they now can access $100 billion in, in excellence, uh, you know, the broadband uh, funding that was put into law a few years ago. So all of those are activities that in many cases started here. So, you know, Davos has a, a special place in my heart for, you know, enabling our community to participate in this fourth industrial revolution, this next generation of, of, of opportunity. So many very large tech companies here, Robert, Microsoft, Amazon, you name it, all really trying to shape the future and having it being driven by AI. Mm -hmm. How are these big cap tech companies doing on DEI initiatives? Uh, I, I will tell you, they all have the proper intentions and continue to put efforts forward. Um, one of the things, you know, all of them are partners of, of ours, and you know, we all know there's going to be phases of this. First phase is going to be the hardware vendors going to capture the vast majority of the economic grant, and then it's the super scalers, it's the Microsofts, the you know, the the AWSs, Googles, etc. And you know, our engagements with them is they are keenly focused on ensuring that we have capacity and understanding in, in, our, in our community. You know, a classic example, you know, we have hackathons across our, our portfolio companies, and in those hackathons we had, you know, HBCU students participate in those hackathons. These are our senior developers. Those hackathons are funded with technologists from Microsoft, from AWS, from Google, and from that actually we've come up with very specific uh, applications and use that we use across our portfolio companies, and in fact, two of those students run winning teams from, from those hackathons, so that's one instance. Another instance is we've stood up one, uh, uh, a curriculum 
at Morehouse using one of our company's you know, stats perform in, in, in sports and highly oversubscribed. And now we are teaching and training and we are having these large superscalar tech companies saying, how do we participate? How do we ensure that you know, these students have a chance to actually contribute to the fabric of this artificial intelligence so that we actually have the ability to you know, ensure that bias does not exist and we're taking into account all of the elements uh, of our society so that we can actually make this a highly productive tool and not one that's going to disadvantage certain communities. I want to switch gears and talk about your portfolio company, so sure. just what you're seeing um, in your business, because we've been talking all about AI, right? <laughs> you're known as like the enterprise tech guy when right. it comes to um, private equity. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for opportunities specifically in generative AI, or are you sort of agnostic and you're just looking for good opportunities? How, do, how are you thinking about that? We are looking, it is an enabling technology, just like other enabling technologies have come and, and ultimately uh, been infused into the fabric of, of our companies, you know, cloud uh, technologies, blockchain technologies. We've been, of, of course, engaging in artificial intelligence for you know, well over a decade and implementing those in products and solutions and services. Gen AI gives another uh, gear to that. And so first thing I, I say, we, we, we put together a framework and a risk rubric of existing portfolio companies. Where's the opportunity, where's the risk, and how do we apply our resources against that? How do we ensure we have the right partnerships with these super scalers, these technology providers, to, to providers to think about the platforms that they are developing to an enable us to develop better products, services, solutions, go to market activities for our portfolio companies. So that's one main thrust. The second, of course, is what I call the productivity nature of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, you know, 68% of our, of our uh, employee base of our portfolio companies are developers. So 90% of our companies now are implementing some form of Gen AI in, in code development, code assist. We're seeing between 10 and 35% productivity increases. Now, huge numbers. You've got a choice. You direct that for, towards building more, you know, faster, you know, uh, products, solution services, or do you use that to capture more profitability? We have been talking for years about the war for a talent. We think this is an enabling activity for us to ensure that we can continue to drive our companies forward and in some cases reduce the cost of delivery. And that's where the, the rubric of, of decision making just, occurs. Sorry, just to follow up on that real quickly. Mm -hmm. But you're not saying you're cutting 10 to 35% of folks. Oh, no, 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 no. Right, if no. that's what you're getting. But, what, but that's the productivity you gain you get from your developers. Now you have choices. Do you actually use those productivity gains to develop more code faster, right. right, and put those into the market, new solution sets, et cetera, or do you use that to reduce the number of people who are actually maintaining existing code bases? Ah, so, it. you know, it's new, new products, new opportunities, or your reduction of cost for maintaining what is your existing code base. So that's, and it's, it, it gives you a, a completely different dimension on which you can underwrite a completely di different dimension on which you can think about your investment decisions and how the market landscapes will change for the competitive dynamic in each of your portfolio companies. Hmm. So it's a quite fun. A lot of technology here, is, it's cool. Like it really captures your mind on what a lot of businesses could potentially do at some point. But are the valuations on these companies just too lofty? So if you look about the Gen AI, you know, we have seen this how many times in, in, in the last few years? You know, so you'll see this, oh wow, this is where we have to rush into. And it's created an interesting opportunity for us in, in, in this respect. The venture capitalists, growth equity, a lot of the capital is flowing to you know, the Gen AI, LLM model type platforms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I always think about it, the first wave is going to ultimately go to the hardware vendors. My sense, two, three trillion dollars of economic rent and value will accrue to that, to that category of providers, some new, some existing, et cetera. The next wave will be these super scalers, right? They're going to actually capture a massive amount of economic rent. The long tail is going to be the enterprise software companies. The small, medium businesses aren't going to build their own solution sets. They're going to come to their you know, enterprise software vendors and ask us for well, how do we utilize Gen AI to create more effective and efficient productivity in our businesses. So that's a dynamic. There's going to, what that's created is a movement of capital, VC, into the Gen AI providers which so some of the enterprise software companies now are looking, the small ones are now looking for capital, they can't get it out of that marketplace, and that's created a massive opportunity for us in private credit. Mm. Okay, so that's where our cri private credit business now, I call it, is overrun with opportunities in, in, in many respects, because they need capital, the VSUs who might be in, they don't want to necessarily mark down the equity values of those businesses, because you know, they were marked in 2020, 2019, when you know, with lofty valuations, but they need the capital. And we can actually put together some pretty unique structures that we think you know, serve our stakeholders, our credit stakeholders quite well. So it's created a massive opportunity because of the gold rush over in uh, in Wow, uh, in, really in interesting. Listen, Robert, we could talk to you for another hour, but 
uh, we got to leave it there. Thank you so much for doing Always this. Always a pleasure. Really yeah. appreciate yeah. it. And enjoy your Thank time you. in Davos. Thank you. Thank you, you too. We, of course, have been talking politics here in Davos, in particular the U.S. elections, especially in the wake of the Iowa caucuses. We've also been talking crypto here in Davos. And our next guest sits at the intersection, you could say, of those two. That is Anthony Scaramucci, a Skybridge founder and managing partner. Anthony, thanks for being the here. intersection of volatility and uncertainty. <laughs> right. yeah, it's, quite a, it's quite an intersection. There's no traffic light, unfortunately. <laughs> let's, let's take the political side first, and yeah. then we'll move to the crypto side, um, since we are right near the elections. We've been hearing from people that there's a lot of concern here about a potential Trump presidency, and people are sort of trying to prepare for it. What have you been hearing here on the ground? Well, I, Leah, you and I have talked about this before, yeah. and you obviously you were lovely to interview me in 2020. I think we sat in this tent. I said Trump will not win re-election. Uh, generally, the view here in 2020 is that he was overwhelmingly going to win re-election. And I think if you survey people here over the last several days, they believe that he's going to win again. They believe that we're, we're setting up for another Trump presidency, and I think that there's an age issue with President Biden. I mean, one's 81, but looks a little bit more frail than the 78-year-old. But we have a combined 158 or 59 years of uh, uh, people running for president. So I think Joe Biden will beat Donald Trump. And it's not just because of I'm being contrary to the consensus here. I think once we start peeling back the onion again, people are going to realize how destructive he was and how damaging he actually was to the country. And remember, we lost 21 million jobs on his watch. The entire economy imploded during COVID. A lot of people feel he didn't handle that right. He fomented an insurrection, which he's about to uh, face the music for at a trial. He's got 91 indictments, four big federal uh, cases, uh, uh, sorry, two federal cases, two state cases. And uh, the most important one, though, I think to our intelligence community are the documents. So you have documents that uh, are misplaced from the White House. They end up in his bathroom. And then they're in the bathroom, and then people uh, in the human intelligence side of the United States are dying all over the world. So I think a lot of people are very, very upset with them. So we'll have to see. Uh, the wheels of justice turn slowly. But I think uh, the, the former president is going to have a really tough time in 24, despite his early successes in these primaries. Would a second Trump presidency be good for markets? 
So I think that the consensus is that it would be, but I don't think it would be. And I want to explain why it's very important. We have the best legal system in the world, maybe us in the UK. Uh, it's very, very predictable, and it's grounded in 900 years of common law. Mr. Trump has told us that he wants to be a dictator for a day. Mr. Trump has told us that he's going to use the Department of Justice to persecute his adversaries. Mr. Trump has told us that his goal will be to expand the executive power of the United States. And so anybody that's really studied our system knows that the flat, decentralized nature of our system has enabled each of our families to grow in America. And so when you have people that think like that and they think in a more authoritative way, uh, it could be very, very dangerous. So yes, it could work in the beginning. People were very happy in Germany in the 1930s, they were very happy in Italy. They ended up a lot less happy. And anytime you get uh, people that think like Mr. Trump, you get a lot of cronyism at the top. And I think it's very, very dangerous. So yes, short term, uh, that's the perception. It would help business. But long term, if he destabilizes the predictability of our legal system, the cost of capital in the United States and globally is going to go up a lot. And people have to look at it long term. They have to think, they have to think about what made the country great was a flat, decentralized structure where each of us could grow our own families and seek our own aspirations. Right. And apologies, by the way, for I don't even know what that sound is in the background. Something doing something, snow. Right? Something in snow. Yeah. Know. Something. Over there. Something. Yes. Yes. Don't. Don't worry. Well, we'll be able to hear you loud and clear. Just wanted to acknowledge yeah. the yeah, environment totally. that we are in <laughs> here good. in Davos. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, speaking of decentralization, that's yes. a good segue um, to talk about crypto here. Um, I was talking a lot about the spot Bitcoin ETF last week, um, which is seen as a real milestone. Do you see it that way? Do you think it's going to be the, the huge um, money bringer to Bitcoin that a lot of over, people are seeing? Over, 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 over time it will be. And I think you, you guys addressed this last week, but it's worth noting. You have lots of investors that went in the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust at 2%. They bought it at uh, the Bitcoin at 50,000, 60,000, 69,000. And so when the ETF became available and they were able to sell the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and take a loss for tax purposes. And you guys know this, they have to wait 30 days before they can reload. But it's a great arbitrage for these people. They can go from a 2% trust into a 21 basis point ETF and they have to wait. And there's a lot of churn uh, and a lot of volume churn as a result of that. But I think generally uh, the notion that this is an asset class that's here to stay uh, people like Abigail Johnson at Fidelity and Larry Fink are working on it at BlackRock. Uh, I think it's great for the industry. Now, what I will say is that we've overly politicized regulation in the country. And I would love to see the SEC move to a more nonpartisan, non-political standard the way the Fed is. Uh, and I'm wondering if that could ever happen, because every time we, we get a new president and we get a, a right-leaning president or a left-leaning president, we bring somebody in that politicizes so, the regulation. So That's wait, very just bad to be for the clear, industry. So you think that the SEC's reluctance to really put a stamp of approval on crypto products has been a political stance? No question. Yeah, this is all born from Elizabeth Warren. She cut a deal with uh, Joe Biden in 2020. She dropped out of the race in exchange for having a lot of say over what happens in the banking industry in the world of financial services. And so she was part of selecting Janet Yellen. And obviously her sidekick in Washington is uh, Gary Gensler. Um, and I, you know, I call them the regulatory access of evil because they're not studying the protocols, they're not studying the technology. They're making this symbolic statements. They're like, oh, this is about fraud. This is about money laundering, uh, where it's not saying that there isn't some money laundering and fraud, but there certainly is. There's more of it with the US dollar, by the way. And I just think the point is, if they calm down and really study the technology, they'd be running towards the technology, not away from it. And frankly, Mr. Gensler knows better. Well, listen to his 24 lectures at MIT. He's actually, at heart, a blockchain enthusiast. I just want to go back to the election before we let you go, Anthony, because you bridge the world of politics. Like the regulatory access. Oh, this guy's good. Sure, yeah. I mean, we wrote it down. It might end up uh, in a story yeah. somewhere. Yeah. But because, you know, <laughs> none of your other guests are going to no, say this that. Guy, this is really good. That's why we have they, you They on. have, like, really good PR <laughs> no, this, people. This, I don't this, have good PR <laughs> people. <laughs> really no, really I do. I have a no, great PR. You're a pretty good PR person. No, I'm kidding. I'm saying, you know, none of these people are going to say that. I like firing Gary up. I mean, come on, Gary. You know better, man. Is Wall Street prepared to support the second Trump presidency? 
I think they'll be agnostic about it. The, the money is not going to flow from Wall Street into the Trump presidency. You know, the money flew into Mitt Romney's uh, coffers. The money flew into Jeb Bush's co coffers. I think quietly in salons like uh, the ones that we experience here, they're cool with Trump being president again, quietly. I mean, they don't like the mania and the over-tweeting. Like taxes, right? Yeah. Well, they've yeah. been well, trying to put well, some yeah, money like... in Nikki Haley, but that doesn't seem to be a, a winning bet at this point. Well, well, okay, again, I like Governor Haley a great deal. I think she's a very talented politician. But, and again, I'm not a politician, and I failed in Washington, so don't go by me. But I just, my observation is when you have somebody like Trump, you have to build a new market. You have to think like an entrepreneur. You know, the most powerful voting block in the country it's 144 million people, and they vote the exact same way in every election. It's the most powerful voting bloc in the country. It's a non-voter. They don't show up. Okay, and so the politicians have taken advantage of this indifference and this cynicism, and they play the game with tribalism. Nikki Haley could break out of that and go seek a new market. There's 144 million people that have checked out of the system. Barack Obama did that in 2008. Ronald Reagan did that in 1980. You have to think like an entrepreneur and go after a new voting bloc and bring them in. Remember, Barack Obama was faced with Hillary Clinton, President Bill Clinton, 30 Democratic governors in the United States that were supporting her and all the Democratic infrastructure from the former president. And they lost because Mr. Then Senator Obama, he went out and created a new market and became the American president. So if Nikki did that, if Governor Haley did that, she'd have a real chance against Donald Trump. Look at those numbers. I mean, he was 51-49. So that tells you that 49% of the people in Iowa, that's a you know Christian place, supposedly uh, Trump country, he only he, he only pulled 51%. Right. Create a new market. Go after a new group of people. Remember the largest registrants now are independents. And if Nikki did that, I think she'd trounce Trump. Well, sounds like a guy still has an ear to Washington. Anthony oh, Scaramucci, you got to leave it there. Of Skybridge. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Party, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know how to work in Washington. But you know, throw a wine party. <laughs> Take care, Anthony. And our thanks to Julie Hyman and Brian Sazi for bringing us that interview. We'll stay tuned for more coverage from the World Economic Forum in Davos during our 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern show today. They include conversations with Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff and Carlyle Group co-founder David Rubenstein. Let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. It's been a bit of a down day here today with all three majors still in the red right now. The S&P 500 down 28, the Dow down 39, and the Nasdaq down 138. After economic data, retail sales came in stronger than expected. That does it for Rochelle and I in this hour. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.